Good afternoon. I would like to call this December 4th, 2019 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council to order. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sure. And next, roll call. All right, Councilor Clucci? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Gleistein? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor, Katarina, Here. Councilor Johnson? Present. Uh, Councilor Hamill? Here. And Chair Johnson? Here. Uh, next, we have Order 19090. It's an act on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title MRSA uh, 4056C in consultation with legal counsel relating to the proposed credit enhancement agreement. And do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, uh, and if you're watching at home, uh, we anticipate to start the rest of the meeting at about 7 o'clock. You're right. I'm sorry. All in favor? <laughs> I was like, what is she, what is she saying to me? <laughs>
Okay, welcome everybody. We have just returned from executive session, uh, so we have taken care of the call to order, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, before we go into general public comment, just a quick uh, edit and a revision. Uh, earlier today at 5.30, we broke into an uh, executive session pursuant to MRSA 4056C. Uh, it was read incorrectly, so I just want to clarify for the record that we went into executive session for ac acquisition of real property or economic development. Uh, so the statute was correct, but the description was wrong on the agenda. Uh, so with that, uh, item number four, are there any general public comments for items that are not on the agenda? <coughs> Good evening. I'm Susan Hamill, and um, I want to start by just saying to all of the counselors um, how much I appreciate the fact that you've all stepped up and are doing what you're doing. I really, I want to thank you. Um, it's important, and I never realized how much time it takes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to talk about um, three things tonight. Um, I live on Bay Street in, in Pine Point. Um, first, the revaluation. Uh, yeah, things have calmed down, but that doesn't mean that everything is fine. I still feel like many, many people in this town got a lot more than a 3% tax increase this past year. So please don't let this issue of kind of recapping the townwide overall result just fade away. The last thing I knew, KRT still owed the town the, the book of uh, code, secret codes, which they created in order to do the mass appraisal. I'd like to see what the values were that were used in these equations. How were the neighborhoods defined? What was the relative value of each neighborhood? The building cost per square foot for the various types of homes, and so on. So let's get that KRT book and consider making it public. And then what's the plan going forward um, to update the, va the, the valuations? Some towns do a statistical update annually based on recent sales. So will we be doing that? Um, it, would be, it would be great to know. I know we're getting a new, a new town assessor, so. The second thing I want to talk about is the library expansion. <coughs> We have spent roughly $165,000 on various feasibility studies for, this, for the expansion. And this is an expansion which might not, and most likely <coughs> will not, take place within the next five years. We really did know last spring, when we were developing the budget, that it probably wasn't going to make the list of high priority projects. But we still gave them $65,000. And the year before, we gave them $100,000. I know that the library staff is very nice, and they've been very patient and waited a long time for this project. But in terms of priorities, it's probably not going to happen in the next five years. So please, when you're allocating money for projects like this, think about it as your own money. Don't waste my tax money like that again. And then the third thing is the 2021 budget season. Where are we with, with town finances as we head into the next budget season? And what I mean when I ask this question is, if we just created a budget for the town using kind of a level services, where would we be in terms of gross and net budget for 2021? If you assume no new personnel, but now you must include the full year cost of the four new fire department personnel, the one new police um, personnel, and the full cost of debt service for the public safety building, which has got to be at least an additional $1 million in itself. And of course, the new school personnel to accommodate the increasing enrollment. Then factor in some mo modest cost of living adjustment. Where does that put town spending and projected tax tax rate increase. Do we have a model that can give us this information? Because this is going to be a tough budget year, and we need to start setting expectations early. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other 
general public comments for issues that are not on the agenda. None? Okay. Uh, item number five, approval of the minutes from the November 20th, 2019 regular town council meeting. And do I have a motion? So moved. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Item number six, adjustments to the agenda. Seeing none. Item number seven, I signed the treasurer's warrants earlier today. So we will move right on to order number 19091, a public hearing in action on the new request for a food handler's license from Zhao Young Chin, uh, Chin, I believe, DBA CJ Asian Incorporated, located at 426 US Route 1, suite number two. And this comes to us from the town clerk. was um, Max Max Dilley. Yeah, Max Dilley oh, down Max on, um, almost across from Len Libby's. Um, as soon as they're approved for their occupancy permit, we'll be issuing their food handle since it's approved this evening. Do I have a motion? So moved. So public hearing. Oh, excuse oh, me. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> public hearing and action. So are there any members of the public that would like to speak to this? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion now? Now you do. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have a second, I think. Any discussion? None? All in favor? Okay, moving on to old business order number 19075, second reading on the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough zoning map of Crossroads Plan District, Development District. This was tabled from the November 20th meeting. Uh, and it is brought forth to us from the developer. And I assume Mr. Bacon's going to give us a brief presentation. I am. Just okay. a yep. Get all tied in here. Plug in them to the wall. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Sorry for the delay. Uh, Dan Bacon here on behalf of. Uh, the Scarborough Downs development team. Uh, we had our public hearing um, in, I think it was November 20th, uh, a, couple, a couple weeks ago, and uh, it seemed clear that the council had some good questions about this zoning amendment um, proposal, so we thought we'd provide a more thorough presentation to kind of help answer some of those questions, excuse me, some of those questions, also kind of help a few of the newer councilors to come up to speed. I realize um, you weren't participating in the first reading for this, so it's, it's fairly new for a few counselors. So uh, we thought we'd kind of back up and, and, and walk through this. So as you likely remember with the public hearing, uh, this zoning map amendment is proposing to include a 15-acre parcel to the east of the current, um, what's called the CPD district or Crossroads Plan Development District. So on the graphic up there, the plan on the left shows kind of a zoom in of that area that's in cross hatching and then how it would relate to the, the big orange um, area is the current crossroads district. And you'll see the surrounding kind of uh, zoning designations. Currently it's a village residential four district. Um, also nearby is a few other zones. You see Sawyer Road, um, that's shown here. There are some kind of questions about Sawyer Road and connectivity how, and this illustrates that now this is not proposed to provide a connection to Sawyer Road or it wouldn't abut Sawyer Road. Um, the plan on the, on the right just kind of zooms out and shows the entire current crossroads plan development district uh, in Orridge and then that, that same parcel and how it would um, fit in uh, with the zoning map change. Um, and to provide a bit uh, bigger context for this, um, this, this actually is taken from the town's adopted comprehensive plan. And what's outlined in red 
is this 15 acre parcel. And this, this larger uh, pinkish designation or district is what the comprehensive plan recommends the crossroads mixed use development district be. Um, and it's hard to make out, but the downs, the current district and the downs property is, you know, essentially to the, to the left and, and to the, so the north, west, and south. Of, so it's in this area. So this uh, zoning designation is recommended in the comprehensive plan, and it's, it's not a new concept, and I wanted to show kind of how this parcel relates to uh, what the comprehensive plan recommends. And um, from a kind of policy perspective, I know many of the councilors understand clearly what the comprehensive plan does and, and, and how it informs zoning. Maybe some of the newer councilors um, don't know as much or, and perhaps the public um, isn't as aware. But the comp plan is really the town's kind of guide for what the zoning should be, what the land use rules should be. Um, so zoning should be consistent with the directives of the comprehensive plan. And that's that's per uh, main state law, and that's really why you do comprehensive planning, is to inform your, your zoning map and your zoning rules. So this zoning amendment, as shown on the, last, uh, on the last graphic, is entirely consistent with the town's comprehensive plan and that directive. Um, and from a procedural standpoint, we've been following the zoning ordinance requirements in terms of process, in terms of what we submitted to, to the council, but also the, the outreach we've done and the other steps that we've done. So, I think you're aware of many of these steps, but you know we've been kind of working on this amendment for a while. We, our first meeting was September 6th with the Long Range Planning Committee, um, who advises, obviously, around long range planning and zoning. And so they reviewed the proposal and endorsed it. Um, and then we proceeded to a neighborhood meeting. And we talked about this a little bit at the last public hearing. The three direct abutters attended that meeting. They had no objections to um, the proposed change. We had our first reading on October 2nd. Um, there wasn't public comment at that point or any concerns expressed. At the time, uh, the six councilors present uh, supported the amendment. Um, following that, uh, we had the planning board public hearing. There wasn't any public comment or board concerns, and the board provided a favorable opinion. And then, of course, we had our public hearing on November 20th. Um, and to Maybe more eloquently than the public hearing kind of indicate the reasons for the map amendment. Obviously, as discussed, it's consistent with the comp plan. It's also the parcel is most easily accessible from the downs. It's, it's obviously in the town's growth area, and we think it's a great piece to integrate within the downs project, um, just given this adjacency. <coughs> um, what it would do is it would avoid a connection to Sawyer Road. If it stays in the VR4 and is developed, it would connect to Sawyer Road. And there's no intention uh, to do that with a, a rezoning. We have good access from all three other sides of the property and, and would not propose to connect to Sawyer and wouldn't be allowed to under the zoning. It also provides a great buffer uh, from any development that happens on the parcel to all the residential neighbors. When if it was developed in the VR4, development would have no buffer to uh, to the neighbors. So this graphic shows um, in green where a buffer would be established um, to, and these are the abutters that are residentially zoned, which is required by uh, the zoning ordinance if it's in the crossroads district. Um, and lastly, we think it provides a, a great opportunity for within the downs for additional development also specifically economic development and additional open space with that green buffer being integrated into the town's, excuse me, the down's greenway system. So it's, it works well from all those vantage points. And we talked a bit last time uh, generally about, you know, what could happen on this parcel, what's envisioned. So we wanted to provide this snippet of the master plan or the current master plan for the project. Um, and the, at least the area in the vicinity of the zoning map change. So for orientation purposes, um, this is the, uh, the subject of the zoning map amendment, this general area. See the green is that buffer shown on um, the earlier slide. 
I know a lot of counselors um, are aware of and, and many attended the groundbreaking for the innovation district. So that's up in this area. Um, and so this is just to the south of the innovation district. And then over here is the area envisioned for kind of the center of the project, uh, the edge sports facility, um, other really important end users. And so this area is really kind of ideally located between uh, the innovation district and the center of the project where we're anticipating um, uh, to be a great location for additional commercial development. So it's a transition between light industrial and the center where uh, we anticipate there to be, there's a lot of interest in biotech um, and medical and uh, potential office expansion space in this general area. And so the addition of this parcel really helps provide additional kind of space and footprint for those kind of larger platform users to, to fit what, and then transitioning with sort of more light residential along the edge towards Sawyer Road. Um, so we think that there's an important economic development component to this parcel um, and, and helps make those things happen. So we want to provide a bit more information because last uh, meeting we didn't have that level of detail. So thinking about the two different zones, it's important to compare you know, the, the current zoning, obviously, with uh, the proposed. Um, so in terms of land uses, and this is you know, higher level, uh, in the VR4, only residential is allowed. In the CPD, as just mentioned, commercial is possible, as well as residential. We talked about Sawyer Road access. So in the VR4, it's allowed. In the CPD, it's not. Um, Buffer to abutters, there's none required in the VR4. There's a 100 foot no disturb buffer in the CPD. And open space um, is a bit different too. So the VR4 requires a 10% open space um, you know, standard. The CPD, based on that buffer, that parcel is going to be at least 50% open space just based on the buffering requirement. So it's a it's a different, uh, and certainly more open space, it's a different uh, outcome there. At the public hearing, there were, I think, a few counselors asked about kind of building height and adjacency to a residential area. So we, we thought we'd talk a bit about more that, uh, talk further about that to kind of add clarity what the rules are today um, in this zone versus the other zones in town that are most similar in terms of building height. So the Crossroads District does allow six-story buildings. Um, as part of that, though, it requires 150-foot setback to any residential district, um, and 100 of that 150 has to be a buffer. So the Haggis Parkway zone, which is right next door uh, across the Haggis Parkway, uh, Haggis Parkway also allows the same building size, six stories. It requires a 50-foot setback and a 50-foot buffer. So it's a lot less restrictive in terms of adjacency to neighbors, but has residential neighbors, certainly to the west and to the south. Um, the BRO, uh, B-O-R zone, is where Main Med is up off of Route 1, where there's a retirement community behind, so that has the same building height allowance, a similar 150-foot setback, um, but a 50-foot buffer, so less of a, a buffer. The B2 zone is the town's commercial zone, allows 60-foot building heights um, with a 100-foot setback, a 100-foot buffer. So out of all of these, um, they all allow about the same kind of building height and, and commercial uses. Uh, the Crossroads District is the most restrictive. Um, townwide. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I think Rocky wanted to, to add a few. Rocky Brisbera, uh, Crossroads Holdings LLC. I just want to wrap it up. Thanks, Dan. I think you did a really good job with a comprehensive look at, at what we're trying to do here. Um, points I wanted to make tonight, the amendment's consistent with the comp plan and the town zoning needs. Uh, it's consistent with state law. The amendment provides buffer to neighbors and prohibits access to Sawyer Road. The VR4 zone does not do that. So there's a benefit to not only the town but the neighbors. Um, it'll allow both commercial and residential development, economic development opportunities for the town that VR4 would not, would not allow. Um, provides uh, the largest commercial buffer setback to any abutting residential zone than any other zone in town. 
Dan just demonstrated that to you. I'm happy to try to answer questions on that if, if you have any. Um, it will enable a planned coordinated development uh, in conservation rather than a piecemeal type development. Um, bottom line, folks, the, the sellers want to sell. Uh, they approached us. It's a good fit for our, our property. It makes sense to develop this piece in a cohesive manner. And um, we're hoping that you can support us uh, with a positive vote tonight. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Bacon or Mr. Rispera? Yeah, a good question for, for Mr. Bacon. And sure. Dan, when you reference the comprehensive plan, is that the new draft of the comprehensive plan or the one that was drafted years ago? So which, which comprehensive plan are you This is the comprehensive plan that is in place right now. Uh, okay. The new one hasn't been adopted. So yep. this is the plan yep. that's governing uh, currently. And then I guess through the chair, can I ask? Yeah. Jay, Jay, question for you. Was there any, I know as we were having the conversations around uh, Piper Shores that, you know, they were requesting some, some zoning changes too, but I thought part of the comprehensive plan process is that as you go through the process, if there's some zoning changes that are appropriate to be made, where any of, is the new comprehensive plan as it relates to this area any different than the old? And were there any, was there any conversation of changing any of the zoning before this proposal came along? So let's see, I'll start with the, so the new comprehensive plan really builds off the foundation of the 2006 yeah. comprehensive plan in terms of land use designations. Yeah. Um, and where the 2006 um, comprehensive plan, as you can see from just the snippet that's provided yeah. on the screen, really went neighborhood by neighborhood in a very uh, defined fashion. Uh, the new comprehensive plan took a little higher level, sort of zoomed out view, and really looked at sort of the um, nexus of land use and transportation and housing and uh, 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 environmental protections in a more um, comprehensive way, where the 2006 plan, as I said, was very much a land use specific, neighborhood by neighborhood designation. So what the, the new comprehensive plan has in it, and it, as, as Mr. Bacon said, this is currently the adopted comprehensive plan, but the new comprehensive plan still identifies this area as sort of a mixed use growth area. Um, so I would say, it's, um, it, and so could you circle back to the second part of your question? I wasn't sure I completely understood what you were asking there. Well, I guess, it, and I've been involved in a couple things because of been around too long, probably. Uh, but I know a couple of times some property owners have come looking for some changes, and, and I think you're familiar, and I think, Dan, you're probably familiar with one of them um, that was down toward Scarborough Beach that wanted to have a, a zoning change made so they can do something on their property. And I, I sat through the session, and part of the conversation really was, well, gee, as part of the comprehensive plan, if we're gonna look at rezoning properties, that's the time to do it. It usually comes up in the community dialogue and other things. So that's that was the genesis of my question saying, was there any input saying that they would like to see a different use of this land than it's currently zoned? Through the current comprehensive plan Through the process, current comprehensive plan no, and really public input much, and uh, other stuff. Uh, certainly the, this area was identified as a continued opportunity for uh, a growth district for the community. Um, I think we can pretty safely say that, but that what certainly came out of the, out of the okay. update. <coughs> Councilor Kluchin, for Jay, I assume? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, it is yeah. for Jay. Sorry, no. <laughs> I'll just sit down. Um, so uh, what I'm wrestling with is that I agree that mixed use is probably the best use of this property um, for the town. So I like the comprehensive plan, but the, that refer, refers to it as a mixed use development district. What was actually written was a um, crossroads plan development district. And what I'm trying to reconcile is the difference between the two. So the way the ordinance is curt currently written, it applies to planned development, so large swaths of land under single ownership. When that first initi or, or, you know, initial development happens, how do we transition from a planned development perspective to an uh, individual property, the owners being able to develop their property. I guess I, I'm trying to reconcile that. Yeah, so uh, um, 
hopefully this will help answer the question if I, if I get at it. Uh, so the, the Crossroads Plan Development District, as you just stated, really requires sort of a, a, a multi-tiered approach to a site approval. It starts with an overall infrastructure plan approval for the entirety of the site. And that's something that the Downs team went through uh, a, year, a year or more ago. From there, and that encompassed the whole site, um, and then from there, what the ordinance requires is that um, there be a master plan of a area of 50 acres or more. And so as part of that process, the planning board works you know, with the applicant and reviews an area. So I think the innovation district, um, which was shown on one of the earlier slides, is a good example. That was probably 125 or 150 acres or so where at the master plan level, the board approves a conceptual layout of street network and infrastructure, as well as lot layouts and use types. But also as part of that process, and I know we've talked about this a bit, uh, the planning board has to approve the specific space and bulk requirements that are gonna be applied to that district. Once the master plan is approved, that sort of sets the stage the applicant then comes in with a, a formal subdivision uh, 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 application, which really buttons down the exact lot layouts, the road network, how the street's going to be designed, what a, a sidewalk is going to look like, where walking paths are going to be, um, and it's a much more detailed approval. And as I said, that starts to lay out where the lots are going to be and where the, where the public infrastructure is going to be. Once that's approved, then an applicant can buy a parcel, come forward to the town, and request a site plan approval for one specific lot. And so that's the process we're starting to go through with the Innovation District right now. I believe there's been um, one site plan approval out there, uh, maybe a two at this point, actually, now that I think about it. Um, so I believe it was, you know, uh, um, applicants worked with the Downs team, purchased a lot or went into some type of agreement to purchase their lot, and it was a separate team from the Downs team. It was um, that particular applicant on that particular lot coming in for a site plan. And then the board, again, does all their due diligence to dive further into the weeds in terms of specific site lighting, how the storm drains are going to connect from that site to the overall uh, public infrastructure, where driveways are going to be located, what the building's going to look like, and, and all those uh, elements that certainly you know, we could talk about at another time. So, so just, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't want to get too detailed, but yeah. when, so when you get down to that individual parcel level, mm -hmm. um, let's say that the owner of that parcel wants to do something different than what was agreed to on either the, uh, the master plan, um, but is, would conform to the ordinance. What process do they have to go through to be able to change, make a change like that? So, so I think if, if your question is, again, let's use stay in the innovation district, that's been identified as a commercial district, wholly commercial district. So if an applicant wanted to do some residential on one of these lots, say, what they would need to do is they would need to come back before our planning board, amend the master plan. Could they do that? Could a, an individual lot owners amend the master plan? I guess what we'd have to do, um, and this would be a question, I, I, we'd have to see what the um, ownership and what the right title and interest would be of all the other owners as well. Um, and so I need to explore that question. So but assuming that, let's say all the property owners decide they want to do this just for sort of ease of discussion tonight, um, they would have to come before the board first to amend the master plan then they would have to come before the, once the master plan's amended, they would come before the board to amend the subdivision plan, and then they would go through the subsequent site plan review processes. Um. Jay, we just Jay, want to I keep you gonna be, uh, yeah. Oh. yeah. We just want to keep you at the podium all night. So I'm not, seriously. Well, thanks for, thanks for your help this question. Away. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> um, how common is it for, uh, uh, potential purchase of property to be contingent on a zoning district change? Uh, that's, that's not uncommon. Certainly I, what I see, what we see more in the town is people coming in for a site plan or a subdivision approval. Um, and, and oftentimes those are contingent upon that 
contingent upon because we don't see too many zoning amendment requests through, you know, throughout a year, maybe a half dozen at the most, maybe more likely probably two or three. Um, I, I, I guess I think it, I'd say it's probably fairly common because if the property owner wants to do a, or I'm sorry, a potential purchaser wants to do a particular activity, they probably want to be sure they can do it uh, through zoning. And I just one quick follow up. If we were to look at this map, because I understand that uh, we created this uh, district, this zone, the crossroads planning district for the crossroads, for the crossroads transaction and development, um, and the CEA that we signed about a year or so ago. Uh, yet this is a parcel that's within that CPD. It's within the crossroads planning district. Do I have that right or not? So I think what we're I, I want to be sure we're not confusing things. What we're looking at right now yeah. is out of the comprehensive plan. Okay. I think, it's uh, not Dan, the, I'm going to use some of your arrows here, here and see if I can get to so, it. So, so I may so, be misreading it, but yep. this is not within the district now. It's, a, it's an accretion to that. They are seeking to expand the current CPD to include the red area that is currently VR4 zoned. Right. And then village residential four. Now this would be the second one that the that the crossroads has requested. I know we did one on the northern end, right? The Warren Woods. <coughs> so that was another zoning change and another addition of land. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Yep. So it's very similar. Yeah. Just to be clear in chronology, the C P D district was uh, created years before the current yep. owners came. So it wasn't a, a product okay. of or came after the purchase that was done well in advance. Okay. And was that Warren Woods transaction conditioned upon a zoning change? Yes. To allow that to happen. No, oh, I'm sorry. It, it's adjacent to Warren Woods, so it, it's a. I think you're thinking of it because it's next to Warren Woods, owned by the land trust. But that parcel okay. that you're thinking of, that was added into the zone, would the, the transaction was contingent on it being rezoned. Okay. That was your question. Right? Okay. Thanks. I have a question for Jay. <laughs> right. So if we go back to the, I believe it's the end slide. So it's the, not necessarily the down. This is not the downs property. This is a, this is a this area of land here. put in the comprehensive plan. Right. Why hasn't there been any other efforts, whether it be from staff or the plan, planning department to, to actually make the zone change prior to a one private entity wanting to change it? So, yeah, so the, the comprehensive plan lays out for the cro for the crossroads mixed use development district lays out a host of different activities. So a number of years ago, I'm trying to remember, it's been probably four to eight years, somewhere in that range, when we adopted the crossroads plan development district, the long range planning committee sort of looked at the area and actually wound up expanding some of the VR4 zoning, which sort of enable the transition from the higher density crossroads plan development district over towards the what you're seeing as the medium residential district areas. So um, I'd say the long range planning committee did sort of look at that and felt that, okay, for the, the more intense activities, commercial activities, higher density uses, we'll sort of put that in the core of what the comprehensive plan looks at as a district. And I think that might be part of the confusion where the comprehensive plan talks about a district. It doesn't mean that this has to be one zoning district. So I think we're using the word, we, though the word district is used in both uh, the zoning ordinance and the comprehensive plan, it doesn't mean the same thing in both documents, if that yep. helps somewhat. Would, would you, would you say? Can I one comment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll go back to, to this plan too, just for context. Um, this RF area, it was, I have some prior knowledge obviously about this. This RF district um, is in the Crossroads district on the other plan, right. the comp plan right. map. It's owned by Warren Woods. It's a land trust property. It's a, there's no <laughs> development potential on it. So there was no reason to rezone the RF to a development district because it's conservation land. Um, and the other component on the VR4 is that these properties all require access from Sawyer Road. So the Crossroads District doesn't allow access to Sawyer Road. So these properties couldn't be zoned 
Crossroads District with the restriction in the Crossroads District not to have access to Sawyer Road. So that's a pretty important subtlety in that this parcel is not needing or getting access to Sawyer Road. These <coughs> other parcels require it or they become undevelopable. So that was a big component as to why they ended up VR4 is they needed the ability to have access to them. So, so why are they included in the paint shade off area? If, if, it, if, it's, if, if that current VR4 zone is, is literally incompatible with the crossroad plan district, why because did this, this come before? This map came first. Before, yeah. This map came okay. first. Yeah. The issue of access to Sawyer uh, was a product of the, the detailed discussion around the creation of the crossroads uh, district. Um, I don't know if that was even contemplated in the comp plan per se, but it came up very clearly when we were starting to talk about rezoning. The other thing I do recall distinctly is that this was a single owner parcel. It was a lot easier to zone because we had the involvement and approval, if you will, of a single large landowner as opposed to dozens upon dozens. I think it's also just worth <clears throat> important to note for, for folks to understand that you know, the, the comprehensive plan really sets the guidelines for what the zoning looks like, but it's really that second level of effort that I think Dan and, and Tom just talked about when when the committee gets into the neighborhood meetings and really talks about, okay, here's the vision, here's what we want it to be, here's, here's the pile of goods that the comprehensive plan talks about, what does that look like on the, you know, what are the exact boundaries of that and how do we sort of meld all these different things together. So I think that's oftentimes, that's where I was saying the word district, I think we need to understand that they really do mean different things in different contexts. So, um, Councilor Gleisney. My question's for me. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe Dan, but I, I don't think it matters. Um, so, so we've outlined in red the, the parcel in question tonight in the pink, but I think what you're saying is there are several um, that would be outlined in red that are not CBD zoned currently. Right, so, so when we go a back, lot of those would, if you were to include all of them in red, so it kind of, the, <laughs> the way the picture looks, it looks like, oh, that's the only one little parcel that's not, mm. you know, zoned the same as everything else, but, but that's not accurate, Correct. right? So, so there would be a I lot more red triangles if you superimpose then, that on top of the pink. Correct, and that's why I sort of flip back to, to this map, as you can see, obviously the big orange blob being the CPD, that's the sort of downs proper, if you will, um, and sort of the, the red area being what is the proposed, and when we flip back, you can certainly see, um, so the gray shaded area, or that. the gray area headed off the page there is what's in the, called the that VR4 district. Um, and then as was just referenced before, the warm woods area remaining in the RF district. Um, Rocky wants to follow Hopefully. up with that. Hopefully. Thank you. Yeah. I got get two quick points. Um, my first point is that had that 15 acre parcel belonged to Scarborough Downs when the zoning went in place in 2013, it would already be Crossroads uh, CPD District. Yeah. Second thing I want to point out, and I'm not sure if everybody, everybody caught this, but had they just gone in when they were doing the zoning in 2013 and everything that was shown in the pink, they just made that all Crossroads zoned, it would have made all of that gray area, that RF, that VR4, none of that could have gotten developed because the CPD zone does not allow access to Sawyer Road. So the only way they could fix that or deal with that was just keep, keep the CPD on the, on the downside. Uh, so those were two points we were trying to make. Anything over here? No. Councilor Clucci. Yeah, I had a question for Dan or Rocky. It, it, it relates to the um, proposed use of this land. It, it's one of the items that you commented on, on your, in your memo, um, as required. But you kind of said, well, well, you didn't specify what use other than you'd do something that was allowed in the, in the Crossroads District. And one of my hesitations is that that's remarkably broad, in that just about every use in town is allowed. So uh, can you narrow it down at all, what your intentions would be there? I don't think at this time we really could, but if you think about what the Crossroads Zone allows us to do, I mean, I guess worst case scenario, we could be a, build a six-story building, but if we did that, it would be set further back than any other zone allows them to be done in. 
so i'm not sure what the concern there is it also puts a buffer in place that wouldn't be there if it weren't crossroads all so i think it's it's better for the neighbors to have it develop from the side but i really can't tell you exactly what's going to happen there um we have this on on this slide dan i don't know how to use the this area right here is being negotiated right now as a, as a future expansion for uh, someone we're working with on a large office use right now. So that's part of that expansion area. And what this does is it allows us to move that buffer back and give us room to really fit a building in there. Councilor Hamill? Two quick questions. Um, is the CPD coterminous with the TIF district? In other words, is that, are those boundaries the same? So is that, you know, can you draw roughly where that would be? Is it so bigger or smaller? Tom can confirm this, but um, my understanding is the TIF and CEA district would not include this 15 acre parcel okay. that it would be added to the zone. This is only a zoning amendment, not an amendment around a TIF or CEA agreement. And, and so also that, with the, the same thing right. for the Warren Woods purchase that you made earlier, is that excluded from the TIF district or included? If I believe, the timing of the, when that happened, I'm not sure. So if it was part of the parcel when the CEA was approved, then it's part of the, the TIF, part of that boundary. So I don't know what came first, yes. truthfully. The reason for my question is I want to know that if you're just by buying property that happens to be uh, you know, next, you know, uh, within the TIF district or you make a zone change, change the, so does that change the value, uh, you know, uh, for the CEA in terms of us calculating no. capture value, the purchase of land alone without no. developing it? It would not. And, so, and actually with both parcels, they are primarily conservation land. That other piece is 100% kind of open space. This one, like I said, is around 50% with the buffer. I just want to clarify, it potentially could change the value. The boundaries do not change without further council action, but it could change the value, so to speak, of the CEA to the extent that they could do more development within the current boundaries. And at the risk of confusing things further, the TIP district actually encompasses over a thousand acres, roughly half of which is owned by the Downs, but even 50 acres of theirs isn't in the TIP district. So I just want to be Clear we're talking about the same things. Thanks. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, if I could. Thanks. Yes. To, just to clarify, I think you said TIF district, uh, but really what you were interested in is the line where the CEA agreement CEA. is. Yes. Right. Yeah. And yes. so this 15 acres is outside that line. So any improvements, actually, you know, the, the day, you know, the day we buy it, it's going to bring the value up and the town will recognize a benefit that's not shared back to the developers on, on that side of the line. Thank you. Anders? Jay, I got one. I have one la last question. Just, and this is just out of curiosity. Are there any other private landowners that are taking advantage of their, that are currently taking advantage of the Crossroad Planning District, or it, it, from any of the other boundaries, or so the, is it possible? I mean, obviously, cross, it's possible. The Crossroads Plan development only applies to what we all sort of think of as the Downs Correct. proper. Right. Um, so at this point, at this it, point. it has not been expanded to any other And there's property nothing owners. in the pipeline? Or I would say, you know, to your question, though, there are people purchasing <laughs> properties within yeah. the cross, within sure. the Downs. Yeah. So I would say those folks are taking yeah. advantage of those. Yeah. But outside of, outside of the orange blob that's somewhere right. on here. There's no private landowner or any bordering that's... And we yeah. have, I haven't had anyone... Okay. I was just curious. ...knocking on the door yeah. or... I don't know if you have either, but I don't believe so. Yeah. <coughs> and and to, part of the reason that is uh, for the part that boundaries is, uh, borders the Highest Parkway right. District, mm -hmm. there's a fair amount of commonality between the two. So many of the uses that are allowed in the HP zone um, are this, this similar, I'll yep. say. So I, I don't see a, a need or desire for a change. Nothing mm -hmm. in the wings. Any more? <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, before I ask for a motion, is there any members of the public that like to comment on the riveting stuff we all just heard? No? None? Okay. With that, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second? Second. And discussion.
So th this actually has been a far more complex topic for me than I had anticipated. I, uh, before getting into this, hadn't read the district language for uh, the Crossroads Plan Development District. And uh, now that I have, it's raised some questions for me. I think in a lot of ways, it's hugely innovative the way that this thing has been designed to promote development within a single parcel. Where my hesitations and concerns are, though, is as you transition out of that single owner development into individual property owner rights, I feel like there's a, some polish that needs to be put on it or a loop closed so that uh, as a property owner, when I uh, buy a property, I should be able to find out what I can do with that property. Uh, typically, you would do that by looking at the zoning map and say, what zone am I in? And you would then be able to read the ordinance associated with that zone and say, these are the allowable uses and the setback requirements and the, the bulk standards. So you know what, what your options are. Uh, the way this one works is a little different, is that that is kind of buried three layers down, or four layers down, uh, which uh, is difficult, uh, or I, I guess I think it's going to create conflicts down the road, but the other issue that I have is when you go, when that individual property owner does go through to make a change, it's not governed by an action the council had made, because the council's creation of this district is extremely broad. You can do and I, I like that aspect of it. it. You have a lot of flexibility and creativity. Uh, but it's governed by what uh, essentially the developer wants to do and then the planning board affirming that. Um, and the planning board has to make their decisions based on the ordinance. And uh, because the ordinance is so broad, I feel like you're going to get in a situation where somebody might come out and say, I want to put a six unit, six story building on one of these small lots and they'll ask for it, and because it conforms with the overall ordinance, uh, there won't be many ways to say no. So that's my hesitation. I think there's a lot of positives to this development, but in terms of expanding it right now, I, you know, I think there's some work that needs to be done to, uh, to polish it up. So that's what. Councilor Katarina? Um, yeah, I, I'm, with all due respect to Mr. Clucci, um, I, I absolutely hear your <coughs> concerns but I think you're talking about the bigger CBD district and where do we go from here, particularly as they split things off and how's it going to be zoned, um, particularly for homeowners, if, if I'm hearing you correctly. As far as this one parcel is concerned, I know I was on long-range planning when it came up, and my immediate reaction was, what the heck are they up to? Because uh, Dan was looking at me like, oh, geez, here we go. Um, but I can tell you, having been on long-range planning and being involved with the comprehensive plan and whatever, that I'm satisfied that if they make this change, it, in essence, what it's allowing them to do is bring their development right up to the current line on the CPD instead of having a 100-foot buffer there. It just gives them more room to buffer um, and move what they want to do for development up to that. I don't have an issue with that. There's apps, I'm, I'm satisfied there's no intent to connect with Sawyer Road or whatever. The reason it's shaped the way it is, because that's the shape of the lot that's for sale. I mean, we have a lot of so-called orphaned lots like that in Scarborough that are landlocked and serve no purpose. I mean, they don't, unless they have road frontage, you can't do a darn blessed thing with them, so. Might as well put them into this <laughs> CBD district and call it a day, is how I feel. So I will be supporting this. Any others? Yeah. So uh, this presentation has been very helpful, very thorough. It has answered a lot of questions. Uh, it comes after we postponed this uh, you know, a meeting in order to have a later vote to understand these. My big issue with this, it, it, and it touches a little bit on what Councillor Clucci said, and that is that, um, you know, this is the kind of stuff we should have seen on the front end. It took us a tremendous amount of effort to get here. And I, I'm sure that, you know, Dan and Rocky and Jay feel like, you know, they're being pulled through a knot hole. But, we're trying to understand, this is literally and figuratively new ground for us and for the community. And particularly when you have a single owner uh, who comprises almost all of a planning district that's in their name, 
that's not that's not the same process, you know. That um, uh, you know, it, it, is the current process really adequate? Answer questions we have about that, and I think that that is really where I'm coming out. And I don't think we've answered all the questions. I think this needs further study, and and though I think technically uh, it made it, you know, we checked the boxes along the way. Um, uh, it it raises questions that I'm uncomfortable with, and and I, you know, stand by my initial feeling on this that I, I'm not prepared to to vote in favor of it. Any others? I Councilor guess, Hayes? I guess I'll kind of echo some of the, some of the comments we've heard. It, it, for me, it's, you know, and I think I've had this conversation before that I, I don't know how many, we've been doing a lot of contract zone sort of exceptions. We have zoning for a reason, what, and especially as it relates to this district, what would be really helpful is instead of kind of getting them piecemeal one at the time, that if we kind of had a comprehensive sort of analysis of what else might be coming so we could look at it in its, totali in its totality would be really helpful. Um, it, I was hoping when, when the question was asked about what do you think you're gonna do with this property so we could get a sense of what that development might look like, we really didn't get an answer. So that doesn't leave me real warm and fuzzy about what, what is this gonna really be used for and how. And there's assurances that there's not gonna be a connection to Sawyer Road now because it's not allowed, but that can change. So I guess I, I kind of echo what we're hearing about. Let's talk about a process. Let's look at these adjoining properties all in sort of a comprehensive look instead of doing a piecemeal one at a time. I understand the circumstances that an individual owner approached, but there are individual owners that are all around those properties. So this will be probably a pattern going forward, and we really should have, as I think Councilor Hamill suggested, maybe a, a different process to evaluate these things. So I think at this point in time tonight, um, I don't have enough information, so I probably won't be supporting this at this time. Any others? So I guess uh, where I am personally is I think that we have a very unique situation in the town where we have a, a zone that is dictated by an uh, individual landowner, and um, which I don't think is the end of the world. But through this process for the last couple of weeks, I think it took too much work to get to this presentation. And I don't know if I have 100% confidence that the abutters were aware and ended up at this same presentation. If, if it took us tabling this, being pretty clear that we needed more information and that we needed to understand this more, I'm not convinced that the abutters and the people that might matter the most in this situation were educated to the level that we were. Um, I, think, I think it was pretty clear with Mr. Bacon's presentation and with Rocky's follow-up that they have a, an office tenant, I believe, overspill that is lined up for there, that we are looking at probably a larger size office building or something commercial. And I think there's a big difference between looking at the CPD district in its entirety and everything that it has to offer, but then this particular parcel could, I think, realistically be six stories tall. It could realistically have five times the density that's currently zoned. And I'm just not 100% convinced that that's been accurately portrayed um, with the abutters and frankly with us up until tonight. Um, so I as well won't be supporting this. So with that, all in favor? All opposed? Okay, moving on, number or, order number 19092, act on the request to move approval of the names posted on the Co Coastal Water Waters and Harbor Committee as follows. Move Vincent Clo from the first alternative position to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021, and Jeff Caldwell as the first alternate with a term to expire in 2020. And this is brought to us by appointments and negotiations, so I think I'll let Councillor Hamill give us, give us an update. Uh, we would look forward to those being approved, as originally submitted. Great update. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any comments from members of the public? And do I have a, a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? 
Okay, on to new business. Order 19093, first reading and refer to the planning board. The proposed changes to Chapter 405, Town of Scarborough Zoning, zoning Ordinance relating to, a, to marijuana establishments. And this comes That's from the, yes. right? Yes. The next one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got this one. Well, I got this one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I knew what I was doing. Uh, Councillor, actually, I. Well, let Larissa give us a presentation, or? Well, we'd love to, if yep. she were not technologically inept. That's fair. How is it? Do we want to save this for the next order anyways, or do we want to keep it here, do you think? No, that's fine. Okay. okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so let's do this. Got me. Let's see how this one is going to things here. I'm usually the one that's technologically inept. In fairness, our equipment's not the most user friendly. Is that this when they updated the tent? <coughs> the same thing for me and your room. Yeah, it's okay. I need to talk about the other side. This is the first display. Jay, we're glad you came this evening. <laughs> I haven't done That's anything yet. <laughs> yeah, for some reason. We did that horribly awkward thing where I just tell you what would have been on the slide. Yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah. That's where you were a couple hours ago anyways, right? right. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's essential for this one. Anyway, that's what I was going to suggest. I was going to say, we could do yeah. this one and then get that. Right so while we're waiting, do you guys want to, we'll, because yeah. these orders twofold, I think the yeah. second one's more relevant, so. Oh, yeah, okay. okay, so, or no? You would like to wait. I think that they kind of go together. Okay, we'll wait. And let me kind of explain, like, okay. well, explain, let me explain why. So they are two separate because the first one, um, hi, Larissa Crockett, your assistant time manager. Um, the first one is, Needs, they need to be separated out because one of them needs to head to the planning board because it deals with a, um, proposed changes to the zoning ordinance 405. Those proposed changes, though, are somewhat of the meat of the matter. They are um, identifying which zones are going to would would allow which proposed commercial activities. So um, the second piece is about the licensing ordinance, and so that one doesn't need to have any sort of planning board review because it's not involving land use, it's about licensing, and so that one will come back directly to you as a town council for your public hearing process followed by a second reading. Um, so if, if, if you want it, they do have to be handled separately, but they are the same discussion, um, and the first one, oh, we're there. Good job, Jay. No, you're going to do great. All right, thanks, Jay. So if it, if it you know, pleases the chair, if we could kind of do the presentation and talk about, and then when you guys are having your conversation, the, the licensing ordinance really is secondary in some ways to the sure. proposed yeah. zoning changes, because if yeah. you don't like the proposed zoning changes, then we don't have any need for the licensing. Okay. Okay? Sure. Yep. Um, let me get to the uh, presentation. Hold on just a second. Okay. So I just want to kind of talk about the timeline that we've <laughs> had for this. This has been a really extended process. Um, I actually did put it on here because it didn't involve the ordinance committee, but the first time that your staff started talking about um, what was coming down from the state and, and thinking about what was going to need to happen at the town level was actually March of 2017. The State Managers Association had a um, all-day meeting involving um, town managers out of Colorado to kind of walk us through what this process would look like. So this has really been in front of staff for almost three years at this point, so it, it is been a really well-vetted process. So. Started in the public um, space, however, in June of 2018. Uh, we had in front of the Ordinance Committee, there were changes happening at the state legislation level, legislative level that were going to allow for, um, we, knew that, we knew that laws were coming down that were going to make it so that towns were going to need to opt in, but they were coming down as emergency legislation. So what it was going to do is it was going to create an environment where there was a lot of financial incentive for would-be um, uh, marijuana retail storefronts to get those storefronts opened as quickly as possible between the time that the law was passed and the time that it was enacted. And if we remember in 2018, the legislative session was a little bit um, out of whack from a timeline standpoint. It didn't actually close down until September. So it was just kind of an odd year. So the Ordinance Committee had kind of a conversation about medical marijuana retail stores 
and whether or not they were considered to be an accessory used to the existing cultivation facilities that were in, that, in, um, in the light industrial zone. So that was the first kind of opening into the conversation. In July of that the following month, um, the town council passed an emergency moratorium on medical marijuana retail storefronts, and that was really in reaction to the legislation that was passed on July 9th of 2018 that created that real incentive to get as many shops open as possible, and the town of Scarborough said, we really need time to have no pressure as we're having this conversation. So that moratorium that the council passed kind of shielded the town from any sort of um, opening of, of retail storefronts in that time period until the state laws went into effect December 13th of 2018, which prohibited any new commercial marijuana activity unless the town specifically opted into it through ordinance change. So that gave the town really a lot of time and space to have a thorough conversation. Um, Ordinance Committee in September of 2018 authorized staff to generate a survey to be distributed um, through laptops. We wanted to not, um, during the election process. So the laptops were made available in front of the absentee voting the entire time that it was here in the town hall, and then also the laptops were made available. Councillor Foley and I um, stood there at the, at the table trying to get people to take that survey, um, and during the actual voting day itself. So the survey results came in. In January of 19, they were shared out to the Ordinance Committee, and what the survey really didn't have anything truly conclusive in it. It showed a, a pattern of certainly preference in the town's eyes of the townspeople's eyes, rather, to um, support medical versus adult use. There was clearly a much higher comfort level with anything to do with medical commercial establishments as opposed to adult use. But the, one of the things that the survey really did show is how much there was not a shared understanding surrounding the, the new law at the state level and what the town could or could not do with it. So we set up two public information sessions, February 13th and February 26th of 2019, held right here in the town hall. Um, our town attorney, Phil Saucier, was part of those presentations. We had decent-ish turnout for them from the public level, um, and that kind of kicked things off. So March of this year was the first time that the Ordinance Committee took up the discussion of how are we going to tackle building these ordinances, and it wasn't until, um, how many months is that? Seven months later, when uh, they were finally voted out as proposed drafts to you guys as council um, out of the Ordinance Committee in October of this year. So that's just kind of the timeline to show you the basic steps of where we've been. So what do we have in front of you today? So just as a, a high level summary, the proposed zoning ordinance, um, the changes to 405, they would allow for cultivation facilities in rural farming, and that rural farming district would also allow for manufacturing facilities, but only as an accessory use to the cultivation. So currently we allow that for other farming. So let's say that you're a tomato grower and you want to make really great salsa. We allow you to do that. Okay, we say you grow tomatoes, and so you can use those tomatoes to make a value-added product. And what we're saying is that if we're going to treat one agricultural industry that way, then it, it's to be consistent, we would allow for that same thing to be happening with um, commercial um, manufact uh, cultivation of, of cannabis products. So then um, also would allow for that cultivation in the Pine Point Industrial Overlay, the Industrial District, and the Light Industrial District. And I think it should be pointed out that currently we do have growers in all of these districts already. So this would just be continuing to allow growers to go into those spaces. It allows for manu marijuana manufacturing and testing facilities. So those are um, spaces, a manufacturing facility is a space where um, marijuana plants would come in or extractions would come in um, and they are then created, used to create edible products, um, lotions, things that are a value added product to that, to that um, commodity. And testing facilities are really a great kind of match, really in my opinion, for our biotech kind of position. They are, um, high-level testing facilities that are there to test to make sure that the products are pure, that the products don't have any, um, that the THC level in them is properly labeled so that we don't have people being poisoned inadvertently. That would be very unfortunate. So um, those facilities would be allowed in rural farming, again, only for the manufacturing as an accessory to cultivation. Highgis Parkway, Pine Point, Business Office Research, Crossroads Plan Development, Industrial, and Light Industrial. Any questions on anything so far? So then we're on to the license requirements. So the first and foremost is that all state authorizations must be in place in order for the local license to go through. And I think that that, so one of the choices that the Ordinance Committee made was narrowing down our own process so that we no longer in this proposal have a background check process because the state's doing that at their level. And since we don't allow for them to go forward with us until they've met that first step with the state, we feel pretty covered by that. All facilities, and when I say facilities, I mean every, go ahead, sorry. No. 
Okay. Um, all facilities, and that means marijuana establishments, so those are your cultivation, manufacturing, and testing facilities, are required to, from a security standpoint, they need to have surveillance cameras, they need to have um, monitored door and window motion detectors, locking safe or, or locking room that can hold all of their marijuana or marijuana products. They all have to have exterior lighting, and they all have to have deadbolts on all exterior access points. Um, odor mitigation, which has been certainly a, a, a clear point of concern for a lot of people. This language, this, this proposal actually has very clear, very strong language. It says that odor mitigation systems must be in place at every facility and that they need to control the odor so that it cannot be detected past the boundary line of that property, period. It's not a can't be detected on every other day or like it can't be detected, period. And they are all required to have an operating plan to address wastewater and waste disposal. So one of the concerns that sometimes we hear is that if um, a manufacturing facility, what do they do with residual cannabis product? We don't want that just hanging out in a trash can at the end of the road. Um, so there are clear guidelines about how that needs to be dealt with. And then um, no marijuana establishment can be located within 1,000 feet of any school, daycare, or preschool. And really, the definition is very clear. If children ages birth to 18 are present there for any sort of educational child care activity, then there can't be a marijuana industry establishment within a thousand feet of that of that property. So then some protections for the town as we kind of head off into this uncharted territory. Um, first off, all licenses have to go through a thorough public hearing and town council approval process. This is not done at the staff level. This is, this is done through the elected official level. Um, and any violation of this ordinance, and that would include things like the odor being detected past the property line, is subject to a fine between $100 and $2,500 a day, and each day constitutes a separate violation. Okay, that's, that's some serious financial incentive to, to, for um, would-be business owners to get this right. And then on top of that, the town has the right to suspend or revoke a license for any violation of the proposed licensing ordinance. So if the, um, let's say that we have a, a, a grower that is not following the rules as far as odor mitigation is concerned, not only are they racking up really costly fines along that process, but they also lose their license if the town council wishes. So those are the protections that are there. And so that brings us to where we are right now. So tonight um, you are being asked to consider the proposed changes um, to the zoning ordinance, chapter 405 as well as whole cloth and new ordinance, a licensing ordinance for this, Chapter 1018. If you do approve that, um, the, if you approve out of first reading, the um, changes to 405, it will head to the planning board. Um, tentatively, at your, with your approval, it would go to the January 6th planning board meeting and be on their agenda for their public hearing process. And then um, if you choose to vote both out of um, first reading, they would come back to you together for your public hearing process and then for your second reading and action vote. Any questions? Councillor Hayes. I probably missed it at the beginning because I wasn't paying attention. Um, where did the conversation go with the retail outlets? Is Good, that, that's a great it, question. Was that tabled or no, postponed was, or? Nope, it was just taken <coughs> away. So um, the, <laughs> okay. um, this, Really, the number of months that this process took was in a large part kind of wrangling about that, what do we yeah, do about the yeah. retail stores? That yeah. is certainly the, the highest level of angst, if you will, for the public. Um, and the question of, well, do we just not have adult use? Do we just, you know, what do you want to do there? Yeah. And it just actually made the whole process a lot easier and be able to move forward by simply taking that piece completely out. So it was not formally tabled or postponed, but, just be, but with any sort of ordinance language, it always can come back, right? So uh, two years from now, there may be a, a council that's interested in, in re-examining the possibility of retail storefronts. But at the moment, this ordinance does not, uh, does not discuss them at all and actually clearly says that they're not allowed. And since the state language is explicit that every commercial marijuana activity can only take place at a town that has ordinance specifically allowing it, they simply are not allowed in the town of Scarborough. Was there ever a conversation, and I'm kind of sensitive to it, my, my son's at a college where they've had nine college deaths this semester. And some of it is because there's tainted supplies of things like marijuana with fentanyl and other stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's some places where at least if there's a commercial shop where it's somewhat regulated, you know, was there any conversation about a safety issue that's... Not to my, not to my memory. Yeah. I think that the conversation that came up was that there were, because South Portland and, so and South Portland has and Saco has um, signaled very clearly that they will be fully open to all forms of commercial, yeah. Yeah. Um, that there are already um, 
retail storefronts within very easy driving so access to Scarborough. So, and, and Portland alone would be able to supply <laughs> most people's needs. Um, so I think that the, any conversation around that, there wasn't a safety conversation, but there was certainly a conversation around that people that live in Scarborough have easy access within 10 to 15 minutes of any commercial activity that they're looking for. Thank you. Yep. Any more? Councilor Clucci? You kind of hinted at this, but how do you regulate smell? It's a great question. You don't. So um, it, you you can't, you don't really. I mean, we have it's it's completely subjective, right? And that's one of the things that we, if you if remember, a couple of years ago, for those of you that were on council at the time, the Good Neighbor Ordinance. This was a major sticking point, and there's a reason that there's no odor language in that ordinance. So. Um, one of the things that we talked about at the ordinance committee level as this was going through is that sometimes ordinances are used for neighbors to fight with each other, okay? So one of the things that we would be looking for for odor complaints is that they were not coming from one household again and again, that it was something that we were, we were hearing about from multiple homes that were, or multiple other um, parcels that were surrounding that. And you, I, it's really hard. So we can send out a code enforcement officer if the smell is happening during, you know, between the hours of eight and four, and we have a code <laughs> enforcement officer available. Um, and but wind can shift and change. So I think it's going to have to be a trial and error thing, where we are taking a kind of a leap off in faith, and we are saying, okay, if there's going to be a smell challenge, we're going to hear about it from multiple people, and that's going to be really good data for us to say there's a problem here. But there are, we don't have equipment to monitor, you know, the, the particles per, you know, in the air. And um, the odor is, is a really challenging thing to enforce, which is why that language was left in is so strongly. Yep. Councilor Gleistein. Um, so there was a couple of housekeeping items that I, you and I talked about. Um, the, the first one was a, probably a missing word. Did you? Oh, the, um, so. Councilor Gleistein is referring to in the, the list of canopy under the smallest level of canopy, we have not put the word mature in front of, of plants, but it's there for all of the others. And so that's kind of an administrative change that we would make at the staff level. And then um, in section 405, there was a ref another reference to marijuana outside of these marijuana changes. I have not checked that yet. Okay. But that is something that we could clear up at a future date. Okay. So, um, so. I mean, one of the things with this is that there's there's very little um, regulation right now in place by the state, and so they're kind of looking to us to put a fair amount of regulation on. And I've read almost all the ordinances now put out by every other town, um, and it's just wildly varying, right? Um, the fees, the license fees are wildly varying. A lot of communities are putting on caps, um, but you know. Right now, if we had a problem with a brewery in town, there's an alcohol, tobacco, and organization within the state. We don't have that yet with marijuana. <laughs> there's a lot of pieces missing so far with that. Um, so, you know, even with just a sign ordinance, we, we have a sign ordinance that only the political signs do we actually enforce that sign ordinance. Um, good job, Toady, she does that. But um, re looking at the minutes of the ordinance committee, um, when, when that particular topic came up, the code enforcement officer said, you know, well, it's dangerous to, you know, um, enforce the sign ordinance. And so we're not enforcing, if it's not a political sign, we're not enforcing that. So my question is, is who, who will enforce making sure the bars are on these facilities? Um, the lights, and then when we get to comments, you know, I don't want to put everything here, but um, there's a there's a number of um, um, concerns around fire safety that the state has not addressed yet with manufacturing, um, and so you know, again, maybe we can get to those. But my my big question is, who is going to monitor these facilities and and do the enforcement? So that's a great question. So, but I just if I can quickly. Um, we do enforce on things other than political signs. I think that the comment that our code enforcement officer made was that they were not willing to send people into dangerous median strips regardless of the sign because we don't actually read the signs any longer because it's against the state, the Constitution of the United States. But I just wanted to kind of clear that up. Um, so the uh, sign was a long, a long process. But there's um, 60 something emails about people saying these signs are yeah, not legal and yeah. they stay right where they yeah, are. Yeah, it's really challenging. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the enforcement will come from our code, our commercial code enforcement officer to begin with. Okay, so they need to get a certificate of occupancy, so they're going to need to show that 
that their facility meets the standards to, to have that happen. And then if there are complaints, we are relying on our very dedicated, very capable, but very small code enforcement department. And so I think we're going to need to just kind of be very honest about the fact that we will certainly, as soon as we have the call come in and as soon as we have staff available, we will be trying to address that. But to get that certificate of occupancy to your safety concerns, that checklist will have been taken care of prior to opening. Up front, yes. but as it, as it goes forward. If I may, uh, Jay Chase, Planning Director, just also offered that um, with commercial sites, our commercial we have we do have an annual inspection for commercial sites that is done through our fire department and our commercial code uh, uh, inspector. So um, there will be sort of that ongoing check-in, and uh, my understanding as well through the licenses, the, the it's a one-year license, a one -year so I think they'll license. have to come back to this council annually as well. So. Um, and Part of that renewal process also involves, um, I believe, I'm, I'm remembering the ordinance correctly, that it re involves review from um, our police chief, fire chief, and, and codes. So it is a thorough safety, you know, we're going to know if there have been, um, for instance, if there have been, just like with a liquor license, you know, you check to see or have there been police calls to that establishment. We'll have that same sort of information coming in for these as well. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Sure, Mr. Chair. So in the RF zone, it was specified that um, there would be, in order to make, do any establishment of the three types that we're looking at, um, that there would be a site plan required, site plan review required. That was um, in this particular new part. It says if you're going to establish anything in the RF zone, there will be a site plan required, site plan review required. Councilor Gleston, I'm sorry, I can't speak to the part that you're talking about. Okay, let me see if I can bring it up. Uh, it's number seven under Z, I believe. And so my question, and my, my question was, you know, and South Portland is actually requiring this as well, and they're making some changes to the, the um, site plan review process because um, typically we're not always asking businesses about their security levels and um, their security cameras and their odor and those types of things. So. My question was, why are we only going to require a site plan review for these businesses established in the RF zone, but not in the other zones? Yes, thank you. I guess I didn't, um, I realized that this is under the manufacturing facilities in the RF. And the reason that's spelled out is because um, those are only allowed as an accessory use to the cultivation. In every other zone, they would automatically trigger site plan review. So they will be going through that's, site plan review. So I the thought. reason is called out here again is because this is typically an accessory use in and of itself does not trigger site plan review. So we wanted to be sure, like every other zone, that it does require. So the plan is for site plan review in every zone. Sure, if it's going okay. in the BOR as we talked about before, the highest parkway or what have you, it would require site. Any more? No? Thanks, Larissa. Yep. Uh, before I accept a motion, are there any public comments? Comments from the members of the public? Yeah, if, if the members of the public want to comment on both these ordinances so they're because they're so closely related, do, do so if you'd like. Uh -huh. Yep. Yes. Yep. That was my question. Sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are we on? 093 or 093. We're in 093, but if you want, it, it, if you want to yeah. come, you can wait. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Anything on 093? <coughs> it's, it's the zoning, zoning change. changes. Yeah. Okay, I'm Allison Bristol, 6 Bayview Avenue, and I think it's Councilors Hamill and Katerina will attest I've been I went to the February information meeting and it sort of drove me to go to every ordinance meeting ever since and it's it's been very educational it's been uh, I've learned a lot and I'll, I'll comment first on my zoning concerns although I also have um, concerns about the um, license agreement and I didn't bring my laptop but I did bring my large swath of the RF zone that is uh, bordered by Highland Avenue, Black Point Road, and Spurwink Road. 
uh, this is a highly populated, really a residential area. It's calling it rural farmland is really a misnomer. It's by and large residential. And so to the odor concern, it is a major uh, concern for all of us that live in that area for both quality of life and health reasons. Yet the draft that's been put forward doesn't include or recommend any best practice performance standards and only requires a licensee to have a plan, whatever that plan might be, so noxious odors can't be detected at property boundaries. Um, and I don't see him here tonight, but attorney John Burke, I think his name is, who has informed a lot of this and has been actively involved, even, even he himself acknowledged at an ordinance meeting that controlling the odor is nearly impossible. So then it becomes the problem of the neighbors, the area neighbors to pursue with code enforcement. And I would liken this to what happened with the Rock Road's Rock Road noise problem in Westbrook this summer. And uh, the, the other point that I would make about this is that it's, I've heard it argued that in this particular area, this would never happen as land values here are too high to attract growers, but none of us really have a crystal ball. And if, if it's not gonna happen, then the question becomes, it begs the question, why would the town zone it so it could happen? I know there are many people who are eager to start the licensing process as soon as possible to be fair to the business community, but in fairness to the rest of us, this particular zoning shouldn't happen. So what I would ask the council to consider is to, like a lot of the other communities that are uh, the opt-in communities, is to reconsider zoning in the RF district altogether by limiting cultivation to the industrial districts. Like I said, as many of the municipalities that have opted in have done. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Uh, I'm Terry Kane, uh, 49 Gunstock Road and Ocean Avenue in Higgins Beach. Um, I just got some comments on what I think are some significant issues for Scarborough jumping in at the beginning of uh, all the marijuana action. Um, I have two themes to pursue and one urgent recommendation. I believe we should choose to, to wait and see what happens and learn from other places. We'll talk about odor as being a, a good bar barometer of that. If we say, no, not yet, we can always do it again later. It's very, very difficult once you've said, yes, go for it to break that down later when it doesn't work with some things we didn't know. Um, so first I wanna say, why does Scarborough say not yet to retail marijuana and then choose wisely to see the experiences of other communities, but not apply that same wisdom to doing with the, uh, the growing and the processing? And it's why are we feel we gotta jump in on that one. And second, the issue of odor. Uh, why, without not any knowledge based on factual experience, would we risk the consequences of learning just how hard it is to contain that odor? We have no experience. Going back again to the uh, first thing that was said is um, if we do it with retail, it's even more important to do it, to wait and see with, you know, letting people have, however they do the uh, exhaust of their uh, factory work. Um, is there any science that proves we can actually control the, the odor from the farming and the, and the processing of marijuana? My answer is I don't think so, but I'm be willing to hear. Uh, odor in the air is not controllable. Wind carries it. Um, coastal towns are very breezy, and that's us. After some, search, some research, it appeared to myself and a few others that almost none of the coastal towns, the genuine coastal towns from Kittery to Cape Elizabeth, where 97% of the sand beach in Maine is, uh, m most of them seem either not taking it up yet or uh, opting out. Um, Maine's, uh, <laughs> the, the Old Orchard Beach, the anything goes standard in Maine has opted out. Um, and we seem to be the only ones ready to uh, dive right in. It's for good reason that uh, other communities haven't gone, gone after this. Um, uh, it's a negative impact that we're risking to tourism and beaches, which along the southern coast of Maine is a very important part of people's economy and their culture. So as we 
if we would allow, I think as um, Allison just said, you know, depending on the zones, out anything that can begin to waft over our, our beaches all over to southern Maine, I don't think that's a really good idea. Um, so here's what I'd like to see us do. Uh, act on the far riskier part of this business, manufacturing and growing, than the, as you, in the exactly the same way you plan to do the retail. Sit back, shelve it for a couple of years, get the facts, then we won't be risking all the stuff I mentioned. And I think that's uh, exactly how we should be uh, working it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? If you're looking to speak, if you could stand and start a line, it will help us with the timing. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alicia Emmerich, 3 Haystack Circle. Um, I uh, have been a huge speaker against retail establishments. I did send an email again to the town council and I was thrilled that we are not moving forward with that um, piece. Um, uh, Councilman Hayes, uh, 2.4 miles from here is Beach Boys Clean Cannabis, just over the line in South Portland. And then a couple of months ago, the grass monkey opened 4.1 miles away in South Portland. So I pointed that out. There is no dire urgency for, for retail shops in Scarborough. Um, after the ordinance uh, committee met and uh, Bernstein and Schur drafted the ordinances, I happened to be a member of a hiking trip. Um, we drove up to Rangeley. I was carpooling with two people from Massachusetts and one man who flew in from New Jersey. On that trip, it was a beautiful day. We had the windows rolled down, and all of a sudden, this stench that smelled like several dead skunks um, wafted in through the windows. And sure enough, we came up, and there were either side of the road field, both fields um, full of marijuana. It was so bad, we were up actually sick to our stomachs. We had to close the windows. It was absolutely disgusting. And that was my and a huge eye-opening experience for me. Um, and I don't know why we would want to allow this to continue in, uh, to expand on it, I should say, in Scarborough. Um, I don't, you know, I view this as a family community. I do know one person. Um, who lives uh, next to a grower, and he happens to live in New Gloucester. And uh, he has, he's actually across the street, and he said, Alicia, it's, everything's locked down. There's pit bulls out patrolling the, the grower's property. There's people coming and going at all times of the, the night, and, and the smell is disgusting. He can't even go in his own yard. Um, so I just wanted to mention those things. And it would be my recommendation, I agree with the prior um, speakers, that everything is tabled, um, let's live and learn, um, gather some knowledge before jumping into um, ex the expansion, especially um, in, in the, there's so much of Scarborough as an RF or light industrial, and I would like to see an over, overlay at some point as to where exactly this would be allowed. I haven't seen that yet, but thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nick Messer. I live at 210 Holmes Road and I operate off Pleasant Hill Road. Um, it seems to be a lot of people aren't aware, but I've operated a 22,000 square foot facility here for six years. I've never had an odor complaint. My storefront's been here for six years. I've never had a complaint. Police have never been there. Um, so the public health hazard that everyone's worrying about, I haven't seen over the last six years. I don't know how many years it would take to see one if six isn't long enough. Um, and as far as the beach towns opting in and out, Elliott, Maine's a very nice place. They just opted in. They're the first town in Maine. They're the gateway to all the beach towns. Um, so I wouldn't think of it like that. Um, it's, just, it's just not like that right now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm used to the much smaller audience of the ordinance committee. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jill Polster. I am general counsel and an owner of Mainly Medical at 137 Pleasant Hill Road here in Scarborough. I also um, have a law firm. I represent cannabis clients in probably 30 towns in Maine. 
So I have the same perspective as the counselors who've sort of looked across what's gone on in all of the towns that are either opting in or deciding to wait. We've, I've probably as well <laughs> been here every single time um, for the past two years, every time this topic's been on an agenda. We've had the property at 137 since June of 2017 with no complaints. And um, just to address a couple of the issues before the red light starts blinking, I would point out that the 2016 Citizens Ballot Initiative was to regulate marijuana like alcohol. There are 88 active liquor licenses in Scarborough as of the last time I checked, which I think was a month ago. And I have nothing really to say about retail other than I respect the thoughtful work that went into reaching that decision. I know that the Ordinance Committee heard an earful from all sides on that, and it certainly is the flashpoint. But I am here to ask you to pass this ordinance as written. It has a few little glitchy things on technical points that John Burke has emailed the council about um, related to technical points on confidentiality issues. So I would ask you just to revisit what he sent. But it's a good ordinance um, as it compares to a lot of the others. It gives the town a lot more regulatory control than you have right now. Cultivation is already here in Scarborough. There are probably 20 to 25 grows right now. Um, not all are seeking to transition to adult use, but many are. Um, I would ask that for those concerned about odor mitigation that you inquire of um, your town personnel of how many actual odor complaints they get. Because like I said, it's already happening in Scarborough. And this is just an opportunity for Scarborough residents, people who've been doing business in Scarborough for many years to expand their businesses. These are family businesses. I think you're going to hear from a few others. Um, and, you know, we, we came here for the same reasons all everyone else does. It's a friendly business environment. There was plenty of com commercial real estate. We'd hate to think that we chose so unwisely. This has always been a town that's been friendly to cultivation, um, responsible cultivation, compliant cultivation. I do want to point out one other thing. Um, the Office of Marijuana Policy regulates us now. Um, they are hiring a lot more investigators. They already have. Um, we'll be on track and trace systems. There's going to be more regulation than there has been in the 20 years that there's been a medical marijuana program in Maine. So we're just asking for the opportunity to expand our businesses here. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Falby, 140 Burnham Road, Scarborough. Um, I just wanted to address the, the comments about rural farming. Um, there's a, there's, there's a, a variety, I guess you would call it, of the cannabis plant called hemp that I'm sure a lot of people have heard about. Um, and, and that's being manufactured specifically to take out one cannabinoid at this point called CBD. There's 140 different cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. CBD is one, THC is another. That's two out of 140. CBD containing marijuana plants can be grown anywhere in rural farming. And Stu, who owns the farm down on the corner of Black Point and 77, could fill his entire farm with CBD containing marijuana plants that look identical to the plants that I grow in my cultivation facility that I've been in in Scarborough since 2012 and that those guys grow. You, you can fill an entire field. I've seen it. I've seen 20 acre fields up in Unity at, at the Common Ground Fair. And it is very easy to do, and it is 100% legal, and it is completely beyond the control of any municipality. Um, so I, I think that is something that should be considered, taken into consideration, that, that the smell issue is a lot more, a lot broader than it's being made out to be. It's not just THC containing cannabis plants that someone can grow 20 acres. I mean, you could fill Broad Turn Farm with, with CBD plants and, you know, the estimate on, on gross of, of, of a CBD per acre is forty dollars to $130,000 per acre. So if someone wants to just flip their farm, they can. And if they're in a rural farming zone, I feel like that they're, in, they're entitled to do that. That's, 
That's what rural farming is, and this is an agricultural product. Thanks. Uh, can I just add to Tom very quickly? Yeah. Is that normally referred to as hemp? It, 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 or, or well, or you know, yes, yeah, that. yes. I mean, that is that is what the USDA is referring to it, and it's come out, you know, just, just recently today and yesterday, you know, rules have come out about calling it hemp, and there's, you know, the 0.3% or below THC levels that are in those plants. However, they smell exactly like marijuana plants. And, I mean, I follow some people on Instagram. There's a guy in Oregon that is taking every single variety that is popular that contains THC and is breeding it to be a CBD plant. And you're gonna see CBD cigarettes that are gonna be the exact same thing as THC containing cigarettes. It's gonna, I mean, just everywhere. It's gonna be everywhere. And, and are you familiar with the uh, agricultural law? You mentioned that you refer to them that just came through the, the most recent legislature regarding hemp. Um, can you talk, are you, can you talk Feder about Federal the or state? state? The state to do with the, I'm sorry, this is not. To do with the agriculture, the agricultural aspect. I think most people don't realize that hemp, because it's, an, it's classified differently than marijuana, that there are no regulations per se on it. It's like growing tomatoes or corn or anything else. Um, so that's, and it does, it smells just like marijuana. Actually, that may because have been what it's you smell, and it may have been what you smell driving up through wherever. Right, that's what I, I yeah. would suspect someone that passed a field on both right. sides of the road that wasn't gated or, any, I mean, right. there weren't fenced in or anything like that, that right. it was probably, it was probably hemp. Right. Thank you. I just wanted yeah. to make that point for the for the public. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Are there any others? No. Okay. So where are we? Do <laughs> I have a motion? We are on 093. Do I have a motion? So moved. And discussion. Councilor Gleisting. Um, so. I started this topic, you know, uh, looking at this with a totally, totally open mind, um, and um, I do appreciate all the work done by um, staff and um, support groups out there who have put together a lot of information um, by the committee, um, and uh, I, I've really come to the conclusion that um, this is this this may work well in the future. But um, now is not the time to jump into these, uh, these three businesses that we're proposing. Um, and if we do, um, I would like to see some changes um, to the ordinances. <laughs> and so I'll first address why I really feel like um, we should just uh, not do this right now. Um, but one thing I wanted to say is that um, it is incredibly confusing, uh, you know, so when you start looking at it, there's medical, there's this, and then you mentioned the, the hemp growing. Um, but one thing I found from people is that uh, they don't understand that anything that we're talking about tonight um, would it impact their, their home use. So you're still, the, by the state law, nothing we're talking about tonight um, impacts at all. It was one of the first questions I was asked. Impacts at all um, your ability by state rights to grow the, the number of plants and the seedlings and possess and use. Um, and so, so that should be clear. And then also it should be clear that nothing we're talking about tonight impacts our current businesses. Um, uh, so our current businesses in town, if we don't opt in, are uh, mm -hmm. grandfathered in under the laws that were passed in 1999. So they're not impacted by anything that we do here tonight. Um, and so um, the, uh, uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to say is that I think that there's some, some um, issues because this is very new from the state standpoint. Um, the state does not even start um, putting licenses uh, out until tomorrow. So tomorrow is the first day that the state will issue licenses, um, and then people will have to get that. There's a whole huge long process. But that's how new it was. So I think um, one of the pers people that talk talked from the um, talk from the public that said, you know, why jump in right at the beginning? So what's in it for us? And I I did want to address um, that 
uh, slightly and what the positives and negatives could be. So um, 11 states, I believe, now have um, legalized um, uh, recreational use marijuana. We are calling it adult use, whatever you want to call it. And I believe there's 33, I might not have my numbers exactly right, but 33 that uh, in total for medical marijuana. And um, in, in all of those states of the 11, the municipalities uh, will get a sh percentage share of um, excise taxes, et cetera. In um, Massachusetts, they're getting 25%. And I know some of that involves retail, which we're not looking at. But um, in Maine, right now, municipalities get zero percentage. Um, of course, if somebody builds something somewhere, we would get property tax from that. And when I discussed this with Larissa today, um, if there's personal equipment in the manufacturing, we would get personal property revenue. But um, I think you probably noticed a, a fair amount of um, holes that could come up with this in terms of enforcement and all of the things that need to be looked at. And so um, unfortunately right now, I see this as pretty much an unfunded mandate by the state or unfunded opportunity by the state because it's not a mandate, we don't have to opt in. And where could some of the, the problems come from? Um, the marijuana, I think everyone realizes, is still not legal federally. And so um, there's a couple of issues related to that. These are largely cash businesses or all cash businesses. And um, because there's, uh, there are some banks that will deal with this, but a lot will not. And so um, that has some areas, uh, some towns have concerns over um, crime and cash businesses. Um, there's also, uh, Oregon is experiencing a demand um, boom and uh, I mean bust because they have way more capacity they have a lot more product than they have demand and that is not because as a country we're we don't want to do it or Oregon isn't using the product they consume uh, they grow and manufacture but it's because of those federal laws the federal laws um, actually don't allow interstate commerce of any of these products that we're talking about. And so even in Oregon, which has a bigger population than us, they're starting to see that um, they have about 25 years, I believe the article said, of extra supply um, for the people of Oregon. Now, again, the, the, federal, the federal people, fe federal government is looking at this, and so it's all going to change, but it just says, Again, why do we want to get in right on right in the beginning? Um, I do have a big problem with the RF zone, um, and uh, just because of the way we've defined it, not in general. Like the gentleman said, you know, it, it's not like it would be a bad use, but it, we have a high density of homes because a lot of farms sold in Scarborough, and the town over the years allowed a lot of development in these RF areas. So we're talking neighborhoods, substantial neighborhoods in these RF zones. Um, and so, you know, you say another concern is um, since uh, in the manufacturing area is that in the 33 states where marijuana is legal um, for recreational medical use, there's been 10 fires or explosions that have occurred in the last five years because of the extraction process. Um, and unions are concerned that there's not enough health and safety regulations in, uh, that have been put in by the states. Again, I think all these things will come. We are at the forefront of this business. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the fires were actually 10% um, when, when all this was happening illegally before it was legalized. Fires were actually um, roughly 10% or, or uh, uh, there was an illegal extraction labs were discovered because of fires and explosions. And so I don't think as a town that we're prepared to, to deal with that um, at this point in time. And so, um, you know, I could read more quotes by, by folks in the fire safety. Um, and, you know, I did study this issue quite a bit. Like I said, I came into it with a really open mind. Um, but once we open the door, um, and, you know, one of the problems I said that I would say about changing the, the reg, if, if we do go forward, is um, most, most of the other towns are putting caps on the licenses, numbers. Um, so, for example, I believe uh, several of the towns, there would be 
allow one or two manufacturer or two to five <coughs> manufacturer plants. So we do have that option. We have opted to put no caps um, in place. Um, and so I think we're just opening the door really wide, really quickly. And so I would encourage um, all my counselors to say, let's look at this again in six months. Sorry for the long talk. Anybody else? Councilor Kluge? Sure. I'd, I'd just like to commend uh, Councilor Katarina and Hamill for a lot of tough work on a difficult topic, <laughs> and town staff included. Uh, you know, this is something, it's legal it, uh, to buy it, to grow it for personal use uh, today. This is just regulating how we want to allow businesses in our community. And um, there's a lot of strong arguments on both sides. And I think where we're going to be in 10 years is not where we are today, and the path to get there is not clear right now. So I, for one, would like to see what the planning board has to say. Uh, I think there are some good comments about caps and uh, whether it is applicable to the RF zone that maybe they can give us some guidance or feedback on. Um, so thank you for your work. May I ask a process question? Sure. So the planning board can make further changes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah. the process um, requires planning board to review. And Recommendations, those changes will actually be made by the council. So it's not uncommon for them to provide very detailed recommendations. Any more? I'd just uh, like to say, as uh, you know, a fellow councillor with, uh, with Jean Marie on this work and soon to be joined by Councillor Johnson, uh, you know, with the work ahead, uh, it, it's been a long process. I've learned a lot. Uh, you know, I was disinclined to, you know, to, to approve really much of it, um, and I understand the the reasons uh, that people have for not wanting to move forward in something that is really uncharted territory. Um, but the trend certainly is moving in, in this direction. Uh, one thing I would say is that throughout we've had two poles, you know, two diametrically opposed groups. Uh, probably consistent with politics today in general, but, you know, we've had the growers and the folks that have been in the business and have been operating responsibly and, and successfully. Uh, they were concerned about their future. And on the other side, you have folks that wanted us to not opt into anything. So <clears throat> we work through this very steadily, very carefully. There are a lot of safeguards. I mean, there are some seven pages uh, of regulations and steps that have to be followed in order to be to be authorized and credentialed and, and uh, licensed to, to operate. Uh, there are, you know, are, are other uh, aspects of this that you know, there we'll be learning as we go. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say that we uh, you know, have made changes along the way that I think have been uh, improvements for, you know, uh, small improvements for each of those sides. But at no point did I expect everybody, you know, we would ever get to a point where it's gonna be a rousing support for this. We, we certainly have the possibility uh, and considered this thoroughly of, of not opting in at all. Um, and we felt that, uh, you know, that was probably not appropriate for our town. Uh, we have also tried to preserve certain things that are features of this town. We are, have a rural and agricultural character in the town. And this, frankly, is, you know, an agricultural product. So we had a hard time kind of separating this out from a pig farm or a chicken farm or, you know, pick your smelliest, you know, rural <laughs> operation. Um, you know, we... Um, but I, I think that the way it's, it's developed here, the, the way that it will continue to, uh, to develop, uh, we have safeguards and we our licensing, we, we priced our licensing very high. I know the issue of uh, not sharing revenue is, is an open question, you know, even now at the state, and there's a possibility of that. You know, but, you know, we will be incurring fees and have tried to set up a fee structure that would, you know, uh, make sure that we are going to be properly reimbursed for for enforcement and other efforts. So, so I, I just want to you know thank the the council uh, and thank the public for their comments and their attention uh, and uh, you know working through this together. So, uh, and and for Councillor Katarina's leadership, I know she's been on the forefront of this and has been very knowledgeable and educated and very thorough and methodical in her approach. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Um, thank you for your comments. This has been a long process. Um, I know for some people it feels like, oh, why is this all of a sudden appearing? But as um, uh, Assistant Manager Crockett showed, there's a long, long process and timeline behind this. 
Uh, we do have a number of very responsible businesses in town. Uh, it is a new, it's part of the new economy, uh, potential economy for the state. Um, so I, I would recommend to my fellow councillors, regardless of where you're at right now, this is your first reading, let's move it forward and let's really, again, dissect it, pick it apart, get more input from the public on the various aspects. Planning Board will be looking at the zoning <coughs> ordinance change. I'm going to be making, we're going to make a slight, we're going to make a slight change to the uh, 19094 because I want to line up the public hearings on both of these aspects, the ordinance and then the zoning um, to come out after planning boards so was all in one package uh, after the holidays because, you know, the, people are busy this time of year. Um, so um, I, I recommend that my fellow councilors let's at least move it forward in first reading and then go from there. Taylor? Okay, I think I'm going to save my comments for, I think, 1904, because my comments are more relevant to 94, excuse me. So with that, all in favor? All opposed? Okay, moving on for uh, order number 19094, I will let Councilor Katarina read the order as it's changed slightly than what's on yeah, your agenda. This is, this is the, how it's worded now. It says, move approval of the first reading on the adoption of proposed chapter 1018, the Town of Scarborough Marijuana Establishment Licensing Ordinance, and schedule a public hearing to coincide with the public hearing on order number 19093, amendments to chapter 405 regarding marijuana establishments. That's a motion. Action. Second. Yeah. Uh, before, to, is public comment out of the way? I just want to make sure. I know you did it the way we had to there, but is there anybody yeah, in the public can. that wants to speak specifically to 95? 94. 94. Excuse 94. me, 94? Yes. Yeah, this gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize for it being out of order, but it's yeah. the only way we're going to pull it off. <laughs> Hi, Marvin Gates, 423 Black Point Road. Uh, on uh, 10A7, the odor and ventilation. Uh, I don't mean to be clever, but I think we've seen uh, something with the various members, uh, some being very struck by the terrible odor some saying they've been in business for years and there is no odor. Um, the attorney, the counselor mentioned that it's a subjective thing and, uh, and that there's no real way of detecting it. The consensus seems to be from the, from the ordinance committee that uh, if you get a broad range of public objecting to it, then maybe there's a problem uh, versus one neighbor. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of subjective argument or discussion about odor tonight. I have a very hard time believing that there is not an electronic meter of some sort to detect the chemicals in the air that create the odor. And I'd hate to see that uh, odor became a problem. And, uh, and you can only, could only deal with it by a subjective manner. It would be very good if the machinery or the electronic detectors may be expensive, uh, but if you're going to put in uh, 10A7 and have a lot of teeth in it, so to speak, a very strong language, if you have no way of enforcing it, uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, you can be the language can be as strong as as you want to make it, but there's no enforcement mechanism. And what I'm saying, probably the bottom line of it is, there needs to be some enforcement mechanism applied to 10A7 uh, structurally. Maybe you need 10 people out there at the same time. There needs to be some definition. It seems to me, above and beyond that. 
it's up to the property owner to figure it out. It's just an argument. <coughs> uh, really appreciate all the work that's gone into this, and uh, thank you. Tom Falvey, 140 Burnham Road. I just, um, Councilor Gleistein, since you brought it up, I just thought I'd throw this out there. Um, there is a LD-335 that's being considered in the 2020 legislative session. Uh, it's a platform bill from the Maine Municipal Association that was sponsored by Representative Charlotte Warren of Hallowell. It requires the state to distribute 12% of retail sales and excise tax to generating communities. It's been enacted in the House and Senate, but needs support from leadership and the Appropriations Committee to make it to the governor's desk. So that very well could happen in the next three months. Thank you. I'm aware of that. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. I so, like I aware. said, I do think a lot of these problems, you know, will work themselves out, um, but we're not quite there yet. Hi, my name is Nick Messer. Um, I wasn't saying I don't create any odor. That wasn't what I was saying. I'm saying I'm abutting five homes and a farm, and their poop smells so strong, you couldn't smell my cannabis if you wanted to. Um, and we've never had an odor complaint, not even from the farm, or any of the tenants or owners of all the five abutting homes. Um, so I wasn't saying I don't create odor, I just have mitigated it and responsibly dealt with it. Um, so I suggest that everyone else do that. Um, and then to his effect of how do you test that, um, it's pretty subjective, but Colorado seems to think there's this thing you can hold over your nose and it's a sensor and you like draw air through it or breathe through it or sniff through it and it should count particles. Still super subjective, but like that's the only thing I've seen um, that's past just 10 of us standing there and sniffing. Um, I think it should probably be just based off if I've got five neighbors abutting me and they've all five complained then we've got a problem. And if only one of them's complaining over and over and the other four have nothing to say even when contacted then it's probably just a bad neighbor complaint between two people having a feud. Um, either way, my neighbor at the farm doesn't even like cannabis, and they leave me alone. They respect me. <laughs> I respect their horses. We're all cool. Thank you. <laughs> Assuming there's no more public comment? And the motion is on the table, so at this point, discussion. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Allison Bristol again, Six Bayview Avenue. And for, for, I'm sort of doing what I uh, had planned to say backwards, so forgive me if I'm a little <laughs> off kilter, but I absolutely must commend Councillor Katarina and Councillor Hamill and give a big shout out to Larissa. This has been a very long, very complex, very complicated process and I know that I've learned a lot and it, it really uh, I think citizens of Scarborough should do this maybe you don't <laughs> because of the learning curve and and the you know you see the work that goes into what everybody does so it's much appreciated um, just one kind of follow-up on the zoning question and uh, with saying I, I wasn't trying to say that it doesn't necessarily belong in the RF district. I don't believe it belongs in the RF district that's bordered along Highland Avenue, Black Point, and Spurwink Road for what Councillor Gleistein said. It really has turned into a residential area and people have to drive through you know, those roads to get to their homes. So it would be great if it wasn't there. And, and early, um, I think in February, actually, Attorney Saucier had talked about having a zoning overlay for this. And then I think it was decided by staff, perhaps, that when um, the retail portion of it went away, that an overlay wasn't necessary. So I don't know if it's possible to do an overlay for one RF and not another. But if not, this is why I'm uh, suggesting that and a lot of towns have done this limited to industry any kind of manufacturing or processing or growing in into industrial districts and the other two <coughs> points that I I want to make is that you know just a reminder that Scarborough voted down 
legalizing marijuana in uh, adult use marijuana in 2016. And it was a narrow margin, but it was a wider margin than voters voted it in statewide. So, you know, the fact that I was surprised that we were actually visiting this at all, I personally would be, um, you know, my choice would be to opt out entirely. Um, and so far, only two dozen or so of out of nearly 500 municipalities in Maine have opted in, and they've all been very selective. Uh, another point that I wanted to make was at the last info meeting, uh, it was explained that Scarborough would consider any applicant that had been granted a conditional license by the state. And, and the way the license is written, it doesn't make any distinction between medical or recreational license, licenses. And as Councillor Gleitstein mentioned, there's no limitation on the number of licenses that uh, could be granted. So again, if you look at an RF zone and they're two acre lots and people can you know, have, grow in a two acre lot, there can be a lot of lots you know, that are growing. So thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody's effort on this. Thank you. Okay, I'm closing it up now. Okay, so we have a motion on the table and counselor discussion at this point. I have a question. Sure. So um, I just want to see if I was reading the ordinances correctly. All, all growing will be in a structure in every zone, mm -hmm. correct? This does not allow any outdoor growing. Other, Again, it doesn't address personal right. use. Personal That's use, correct. you can grow outdoor. But anybody that applies for a license cannot grow outdoor. Is that correct? For commercial, correct. Okay. Yep. Any more? I do have a comment, okay. if nobody else. I didn't want to just. Um, so um, I just want to say, the, you know, the work is great. And so I hope I, I hope it didn't come across as, as critical. Um, and I don't think the work will be lost at all. I just think all the work we've done will be enhanced by watching the other municipalities as they go <laughs> forward with this. Um, and um, I appreciate what you said about the RF uh, districts, but um, on my side of town, it's the same thing. It's not just uh, Black Point in that area. You know, we have major residential um, uh, construction over there in the farms. Um, and so uh, that I just wanted to, add. oh, and then in t terms of the odor, um, you know, uh, California has had a problem, but uh, they actually have passed a state law related to it which did represent an unfunded mandate to the municipalities, but um, their approach has been uh, an odor task force. Uh, so it's a group of people that have to come together and certain actions have to be taken and there is criteria for what has to be done when. So it was kind of interesting to read what California has done specifically, um, not just this one issue, but this is what drove it. Um, and so uh, I'm not saying we would go down that road, but we don't have anything like that from the state. So anything we did would have to be done by the municipality. Any more? No? So I guess uh, my only cu couple, and these are more thoughts than anything, because this is just first reading, so this can be massaged. Um, personally, I looked at this, I think the RF zoning is a little bit of a tricky situation. When we think RF, we think, mm -hmm. like my house, chickens, two acres, I'm smelly anyways, it doesn't matter. But there's plenty of RF that is very residential in our town. Uh, I don't think I'd be in favor of capping anything, but I think it might be worth exploring limiting the tiers in RF, perhaps only tier one, tier two, or, or what have you. Um, and to uh, Councillor Gleistein's point about the odor patrol, I think, yes, it's subjective, but if we, if we put the sole power to make that distinction in code enforcement, then yes, it's a sub subjective decision, but if we, Maybe we solve that by saying specifically who is who is able to make that distinction. So it's not your neighbor, it's not you. It's code enforcement can make it. Mm -hmm. um, so that might help. That might help clear up some of those anxieties. So with that, I will uh, take a vote. All those in favor, and all those opposed. Great. Uh, okay, moving on to order number 19095. This is going to be read slightly different than it is on the agenda. Oh, another one, that's right. <laughs> you, want to, you want to move it? It's a move. 
Oh, sure, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. Just because it's a motion. So. Yeah. You got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll have Councillor Katarina read it uh, again for us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> order 19-095, move approval of the first reading and waive the second reading on the request from the Finance Subcommittee of the Ad Hoc Community Center Advisory Committee to allocate up to an amount not to exceed $16,000 for an outside consultant and to authorize the town manager to redirect $16,000 from management information systems staff full-time pay for this allocation. And before I take a motion, do we have a presentation by the Finance Subcommittee of the Ad Hoc Community Center Advisory Committee? <coughs> you guys got to shorten your name. It's all right. You want me to wait? Here? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so more of a statement than a presentation, but um, just a quick overview of what we've been doing. The uh, subcommittee, finance subcommittee of the um, Ad Hoc Community Center Advisory Committee uh, is tasked with putting together an operating budget for the community center. Um, we've been working for the past several weeks with Councillor Clucci, um, as well as the community services director, Todd Souza. Um, we've been reviewing uh, numerous feasibility studies from around the country and looking at membership data when we can get it from um, surrounding communities. And the viability of the community center is gonna depend on a <coughs> number of factors, but one factor in particular that carries with it um, a considerable amount of uncertainty is membership sales. Um, this is gonna depend on the market and um, looking at some of the other feasibility studies, some of the other comparable facilities it's very common for membership sales and attendance to drive over 80% of the revenue. Um, so it's critical that we get this right. Um, and the finance subcommittee is going to do our own projections. We have data sources. Um, like I said, we're pulling data from surrounding communities when we can get it. The neighboring communities will not share membership counts with us uh, because we are a potential competitor. Um, so we have to reach a little bit outside of our service area, but we're starting to get some of those numbers now. Um, in addition to that, we have a market analysis from the National Recreations and Park, Recreation and Parks Association um, for our service area, and we also have the data from the survey that we conducted. So we do have data sources that we can use to put together our own projections. Um, but considering this is such a critical component, um, of the viability of the community center, we feel it's important to bring in professional help, um, someone who knows the parks and recreation market, um, someone who has done this uh, dozens of times, if not hundreds of times before. Um, so two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, the committee uh, voted to direct the finance subcommittee um, to develop leads and solicit proposals from parks and rec consultants um, we started by looking at some of these fe feasibility studies and looking at the consultants who had done some of the more thorough and successful ones and reaching out to them directly, um, looking for similar consultants and reaching out to them. And since then, we have made progress with three of the firms. Um, we have two formal proposals and one estimate that just came, came in last night. Um, and what's... What's in front of you now, the 16,000, came from our first proposal. Um, this is for a full operations analysis that will analyze in detail um, the expenses and the revenue. Um, it will advise us on revenue strategies. Uh, it will produce a performa that outlines every, every item of expense, every item of revenue. Um, it will also do a brief market analysis uh, and this, this firm is, the firm is local, uh, but I should be clear that they recently acquired a firm out of Boston, and it's the Boston firm that would be the Parks and Rec um, department. Mm -hmm. And the team that has been assigned to us, if we move forward with this firm, is actually the consultants from Boston. The principal on the project is the only one actually located in Portland. Um, so just to make that clear. 
Uh, the second proposal we have is actually slightly higher than the 16,000. It came in 48 hours ago for 18,000. Um, they are out of somewhere in the Midwest, Illinois, I believe. Um, so their travel expenses are slightly higher. But aside from that, the scope of work is almost identical to the first consultant. Um, and then the third that we have, uh, the estimate, like I said, came in last night is considerably higher. It's 26 to 29,000. Um, this is because they refuse to, um, I don't refuse, that's kind of harsh. Um, they are not willing to uh, narrow the scope, <laughs> if that's any different. Um, they're not willing to narrow the scope quite as much as the other consultants are. Uh, they would want to come in and do a complete market analysis, um, uh, do uh, a demographic study and uh, survey uh, for a needs assessment before doing the operations analysis, which is the key point that, that we're looking for. Um, so that's where we are with the, with the three proposals or three firms. Um, as far as next steps, if uh, the funds are approved, then at our next meeting on Monday, uh, we would put this before the full committee and the full committee would vote. Um, and if they, if the full committee were to approve it, we would proceed immediately with the, um, with the consultant that we choose. Um, if they are not approved, uh, the finance subcommittee will absolutely still do this work for the projections. We will do the revenue projections, the expense projections. Um, but like I said, based on the, the data sources we have. Uh, but I do want to encourage the council, though, if, if you don't approve the funds now to do this, I, I do think that this, this piece is critical to get right. Um, and whether it's now or later, I, I do think it's important to have a, an independent professional um, come in and vet this work. So if there are any questions? Councilor Hayes. I've heard something about unless we can get to a decision by February 1st, Edge and they're going to move ahead with the project anyway. So based that we're sitting here in the holidays, I mean, is the timeline even feasible that if we spend this money, we're going to get a work product back in time for us to be able to factor that into our conversations? So the, the timeline from, from all three uh, consultants is mid to late February. So if, if there is a hard deadline uh, that town council faces um, that is prior to that, then yes, the, the work would not be in time for that deadline. But wasn't, wasn't there a hard deadline kind of shared at some of the meetings by? I, I've heard things, um, but I, I haven't heard anything official as far as a hard deadline. So I think that'd be important. I mean, it would be if if we're going to spend sixteen thousand, but the work product's not going to be able to be used in the time that's in front of us. That would be an important consideration for me. Second question I had was, of the three entities you're looking at, do any of them have any any type of business connections to any of the parties involved in the transaction? Not that we're aware of, um, and we we've done we've searched into that we have looked yeah, into it yeah. um, but you know we're not private investigators um, so <laughs> based on our expert um, investigation no I mean you could you could ask them as part of the you know j just a thought and then the third yeah. the the one that wanted to do the full needs assessment did they say why it was important to their process that they do both the front end and the back end um, no no they haven't but we could certainly ask that Thank you. Any others? Matt, do you think the um, so do you th is this work does this work have value if we if if we weren't to choose this partnership does this work still have value? I believe so. If we move forward with a community center, whether it's a lease or a self build, at any point, um, it will be important to uh, have a professional vet this work. I mean, all of these feasibility studies we looked at. Um, communities engage with uh, consultants actually to do a much broader scope than even than what we are looking at. Yeah. Council Glasstein. Did you say this includes travel, all of your quotes? Yes. Okay. Yep. 
All right. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. And so with that, do I have a motion? So moved. Public Second. comment. Oh, excuse Oops. me. He's, yes, there is. Would you like to make one? No. You have to go to the podium. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Matt Tanello, uh, 33 Powderhorn Drive, Scarborough. Um, I'm also on the committee with Matt, and uh, I happen to be the chair. And I want to uh, provide my complete support for the Finance Committee recommending this, uh, this study be done. We, as a committee, were given a very, very broad and all-encompassing task to come up with uh, the uh, with the, the charge that was given to us to evaluate a community center, evaluate the feasibility, evaluate whether a lease agreement from a third party developer would be a recommendation of ours to go forward, and then to evaluate whether a, a comparable facility built within the town by the town through a different financing mean, mean, uh, means would, would be a viable uh, option. We started this effort uh, a couple months ago. We've got a number of committed volunteers that have been working every single Monday uh, since, since we started, putting in a ton of effort. Uh, we started with what we thought was a very data-driven type process, which started with a survey that we were extremely happy with. The quantity of survey results we got that helped us establish what the baseline for community center would be. We are going to bookend that with two cost estimates for, uh, in, uh, by two of our committee members, myself using uh, my <coughs> firm's cost estimator to evaluate the cost of the self-built facility along with Kevin Freeman, who another committee member, to use his firm's estimating department to cost it. We have bookended it with a survey to establish what the baseline scope should be. We're gonna use the other side to cost it out. There is a big variable in the middle there, which is what is the revenue stream that we can count on and what is the membership that we could plug in that is actually going to serve or provide this revenue. We have some great financial people on the committee. Without an independent entity validating what we cook up as our opinion of what members will actually be participating in a membership to a community center and what they are willing to pay, there is some big question in my mind and our mind as to how valid our entire assessment is without this centerpiece of looking at what the revenue stream could be. So um, I'm hoping that you vote positively about on, on going forward with the study. It really will support our, all the effort that all the volunteers have put forth. And um, I want to commend Matt for going out and getting <coughs> some very nice proposals. I did review the recommended proposal and um, am familiar with the, the lead person in the, the uh, Boston market. She worked formerly with a, uh, a, an architecture firm that we're currently building an athletics facility for uh, or with up in, uh, up in Waterville, Maine for Colby College. <laughs> And uh, she comes uh, well, well credentialed, and um, I'm supportive of the, the the effort here. So, thank you, Matt. I know you're a member of the public, but can you just stay up in case there's questions from us? Just because you are the chair of the committee. Sure. Are there any questions for Mr. Tanello while he's up here? Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, discussion. Councillor Clucci. Yeah, so I mean, I've obviously been engaged with the committee, and I, I, uh, I fully support this. Yes. I think it's the responsible thing to do for from the committee's perspective. I uh, have an analytics background, and I could come up with 100 different ways to try to estimate this, but the variance around my estimates is going to be rather large. And when you bring in a professional that has experience in a relatively narrow field like this, uh, they're going to have a much smaller variance or level of uncertainty. And at the same time, they can uh, just check the work that's been done by the committee and opine on it. Now, as to timing, yeah, it creates, I haven't heard a deadline from the developer, but um, 
we have a say in what our deadline is as well. Right, right. So I, uh, there's got another agenda item to push the deadline already to January. The intent of the committee would be that they would produce their report and then we would have this report come in as an independent kind of validation of that work after the fact. So there wouldn't be, um, they would work with the, the consultant obviously to, to produce it, but it's more for our benefit, I think. Should we get to that point where their initial analysis <coughs> looks like this is something that may or may not be um, worth proceeding with, uh, this report will come in and just add to the uh, documentation of the process that we have, that, that we went through, so that whether this works or not, we have something to refer back to. Uh, that would be a really good leap off point for another effort down the road. So I support this. Councillor Hamill? Yes, I, I am also in support of this. Uh, the amount of money requested <laughs> and also the justification provided. Uh, you know, I think we tasked this committee with a very challenging uh, project uh, with a very tough time frame, and I think they, uh, you know, I was impressed that they came forward and made this request, and I don't think they, they, did it, they took it lightly. And um, uh, I think that worst case, this, uh, if, if all fails in terms of this project, we'll still have that to use in a future date when it comes back around again as an issue. So, so I'm very comfortable with it, the process and how they selected the, uh, the consultant and have been very thoughtful and thorough. So I uh, support this. And uh, I, I was uh, worrying uh, for a little while before we got to the revised motion where we were struggling over the source of funds, but I want to thank Tom Hall for his wizardry and, and uh, flexibility in coming up with solutions. So thank you. Councilor Katarina? Um, I would say ditto to everything that Councilor Hamill said. Uh, I will be supporting this. I think that um, we only have one bite at this apple, so let's do it right. Um, I also want to thank the town manager for finding money other than the 10000 that I had asked to be put aside for a survey <laughs> because we do have, uh, you know, we do have a lot of uh, capital pressure, development pressures on us, and I think we're going to need that survey money to get a better picture as to who's on first, who's on second, and whatever. But that's a different subject, but yes, I'm, I'm in favor of the $16,000. Councillor Hayes? Yeah, I mean, ditto, I think, to everything that's been said, totally support doing this. I think it's, it's a due diligence step so that it's almost our fiduciary responsibility that we do need to do. This is, this is a big project. so absolutely support it but I, I will make an appeal to all of us up here I think it'd be a real disservice to our public and I think from a public perception point of view it'd be really unfortunate if we made a decision prior to getting the results of this report oh, so, so I think we need to commit to that whatever the timing is we should move it along but this is a critical piece of information we need to have in front of us before we make any commitment or so if everybody if that's everybody's understanding then I'm very comfortable with this Thank you. And thank you for all the work that I know you guys have been meeting and putting heart and soul into it. So thank you. So for me, it comes down to my personal experience a year ago with Scarborough Downs. I think it was a huge financial decision. And one of the things that I wanted was a, a several of us wanted was a third party validation. We ended up getting something that wasn't quite what I think we had in, in mind. I remember it ended up being more about the, the modeling technique of the software, not so much a third party coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so this really, in my mind, hits the mark that I foresee the council is going to want. Um, so I can I applaud the council of having the foresight to, to understand that we're going to want this in a month or two. Mm -hmm. And so it, we might as well do it. Um, so, did a great work. <laughs> so, and um, and uh, I, I think it's it's worthy to do this. My problem is with the timing. Um, uh, we're going to see what the Downs is putting forward um, in five days or whatever on Monday. It's not our meeting; it's your meeting. Um, but uh, you know. There is this compressed time frame for this overall process. Um, what I would love to see is this entire feasibility study done um, over a longer period of time. Um, and so uh, at this point, um, I would, I am a no because of, you know, the money and the uncertainty of the dates. 
and because it wasn't a pre-planned expense um, for the town that we've kind of jumped this particular project in front. But I'm not a no because of the committee recommendation. I think it's a great recommendation. I would be more inclined to say yes on this, and it's not gonna really matter because I think there's four um, yes, but I would be more inclined um, if we had, you know, if we were voting on this like in two weeks, not tonight so that we actually had a little more information coming back from on how where this project stands from the developer because if the numbers come back huge from the developer, this might not be something that we need to pursue at this time. We, we just don't know. We just don't have any information right now and so that's why I'm hesitating to spend $16,000 of taxpayer money. Any more? I, you know, I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna reply to you real quick. Is the numbers are gonna come back huge, and that's precisely why we need this because we need to understand how much huge offsets they're huge. So, and I think having a third party validate that answer that question is gonna be huge. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's past nine. Sorry. Uh, with that, all in favor? And all opposed? Okay, now we're on to order number 19096, act on the request from the Ad Hoc Community Center Advisory Committee to amend their charge approved on September 4th, 2019 to extend their reporting time from December 15th, 2019 to January 17th, 2020. And this is at the request of the Ad Hoc Community Center Advisory Committee. So Mr. Tanello, would you like to give us a presentation or a quick overview? Okay. So we are asking for an extension uh, primarily because the developer asked for an extension first. <laughs> and um, we met our initial timelines, which they asked for. Um, they asked, uh, the developer asked for a program uh, on which they would price and prepare a proposal to us. Um, they asked for two additional weeks. It pushed us into a, um, a holiday pair of weeks, so we're asking for a little bit more. So we are asking to go from December 15th to January 17th. Um, with the holidays, to the 9th. let me just make sure I'm right on this. Yes, our, des our deadline was supposed to be the 15th. We're pushing to the 17th. And um, I believe uh, to, to address a question from the previous session, uh, I believe our finance committee will be plugging in uh, modeling information into our financial model that will have variables for the quantity of members we anticipate will be uh, predicted to be members of a community center and the values, the dollar values at which they would be members once the report comes back from the third party consultant, we will be able to switch out to validate those plug-in numbers and essentially provide an updated model for the committee for the uh, council. So we don't expect you would be make, taking action on our initial. We anticipate that within a couple weeks later we'll be getting uh, the validated third-party data. So um, that's what we like. Questions for yeah. Councillor Hayes? Yeah, just on that, on that last point, I just, sometimes with this community, <coughs> what they read first is what sticks. So I just- I'm sorry, I, could you say that one more time? I guess a concern that I might have with what you just shared, if that on the 17th, if you're gonna plug in the early estimates of revenue, mm -hmm. and it tends to be a much different number than comes back from the consultant, sometimes this community seems to take the first number. So then you're gonna, mm -hmm. you're gonna set up sort of dueling numbers I just wonder if we're better leaving the revenue side blank until we get the consultant's numbers. We'll have, we'll, we'll have two camps. One will pick whichever number oh, they sure. like best to use to argue, which may be more, more confusing than just a number. Okay. We, just we can take that in advisement during the rest of the, yep. the, the meetings. Absolutely. Thank you. Good thoughts, though. 
That's true. Uh, any public comment? None. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? None opposed? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Order number 19097, act to appoint appointment, excuse me, of Nick Kluder as the assessor for the town of Scarborough, effective December 30th, 2019. Remind that I'd love Marissa Crockett to introduce uh, the assessing department of finance are under her uh, supervision. So. Uh, so thank you. David Buffard has been our assessor for the last two years, and he is very excitedly retiring. Um, <laughs> and I'm so jealous. we needed to find a replacement. And in the past, when we've gone out for an assessing, um, for an assessor, it's been a real challenge. And this time, we were really very fortunate to have a number of, of highly qualified applicants. And one um, who happens to also be a Scarborough resident was the unanimous choice of the hiring committee. So love to introduce Nick Cloutier to you. Um, he currently sits on our Board of Assessment Review. And he um, is, at the moment, the assessor for the town of Brunswick. And he will be joining us as of providing you agree to the appointment. Um, he's coming on board on December 16th to have some crossover time with Dave Bufard. But if you approve his appointment, he will be the acting assessor, and the assessor, rather, as of December 30th. So let if Nick kind of speak for himself for a moment. Thank you all for giving me a little time to talk to you and introduce myself. I'll keep it brief. It's quite late. <laughs> I applaud your stamina. So um, I really look forward to serving the town of Scarborough as the next assessor, assuming all goes well. And uh, I wanted to come tonight as an example that I intend to make myself available to both the council and to the residents of the town to uh, keep everybody informed and to learn so I know how to serve Scarborough best and so people feel confident moving forward after a revaluation that they're, everyone's on the same page and that their concerns are addressed in a transparent manner. I know that's pretty important to educate people. It's a confusing time after a revaluation, and I just uh, dealt with that in Brunswick. Uh, we had KRT do a revaluation there, so I'm not, it's not foreign to me. So I look forward to serving the town I live in here in this capacity. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Cloutier? I have one. Is it Cloutier or Cloutier? I go, I go by Cloutier. Perfect. <laughs> no, no relation, but no, yeah. Try to keep it straight. It's up to you. Yeah. you I, I won't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Is there a motion on the table? So move. Second. Discussion? Councilor Katarina? Um, I would be thrilled. For us to appoint uh, Mr. Cloutier to um, this position, um, God love you. That's all I get to say. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Clucci? Uh, yeah, so this will be fun, Cloutier. <laughs> yeah, it'll be. I ha it happens at home all the time. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think it's a testament that you sat through the meeting for three hours or so so that um, we could get to know you and, and meet you. And um, I can say that uh, meeting you beforehand, I was extremely impressed impressed with your qualifications and really look forward to uh, the an analytic ability that you'll bring to the position and uh, the cohesiveness that, that, that I think you'll bring to the team. So welcome, uh, hopefully welcome uh, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Hamill. I had a question if I may. What motivated you to pursue a career as an assessor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had some mentors that uh, suggested I might be a good fit and they were absolutely correct. <laughs> Um, it's a good combination of my analytical, analytical skills, but also my ability to deal with people when they're upset. <laughs> and I look forward to using both of those skills here in Scarborough. Key success factors. I feel like he's answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. Success yeah. Humor will also no doubt help, so thanks. Welcome. All right, with that, all those in favor? And none opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Carroll, my apologies. Order number 19098, <laughs> act to authorize the town manager to sign a renewal lease agreement with Abigail Carroll and Nonsuch none Oyster Limited Liability Company for the use of the sell side, sell side of the town pier for an upweller float for oysters. And this is brought to us by the town manager. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll do a quick introduction to Abigail and then you can speak to it. Uh, so back in 2009, uh, Abigail and her 
on behalf of her company, done such oysters, came forward. As I recall, you were the first aquaculture lease uh, in Scarborough, and certainly in the Scarborough River. Certainly the operating one, yes. There was a, a relay because someone's site had gotten closed somewhere else. Nate, yes. uh, Pine, who is now Pine Point Oysters. So is part of that operation, a uh, request was made of the town for, to allow her to place a float on the inside of our fixed pier mm -hmm. that would allow her to uh, kind of a working platform, but also at the time the notion was for a bit of a nursery to help, uh, yes. help the business. Most recently, uh, the lease is being modified and the license agreement uh, must be modified along with it. Uh, here. contract with the Department of Marine Resources. And, and uh, that type of lease um, apparently is no longer uh, compatible with the, uh, the essential habitat zone that we operate in in, that, in, the, in the estuary there. So they have um, pulled everybody's uh, limited purpose application, that's the type of lease this is. So while our big larger lease is fine, this one is no longer, um, I'm no longer allowed under that type of lease to conduct aquaculture on that float. So, um, but as chance would have it, we really actually stopped using that as our nursery. We're just growing the baby oysters out in the field on our larger lease anyhow. So this didn't, um, in terms of our aquaculture and growing livestock, this didn't have a huge impact on our operations. However, we are very happy to be able to park our boats there, to use it as a, as a working platform. And um, we've grown big enough now so that it would be a real compromise for us not to be able to have that, that space available to us. And we've, um, it also keeps us out of the way of the lobster men and everybody else down there. And I, I, I think generally we have a pretty good working relationship with everybody down there. It's something I'm very proud of. So I would be very happy if you would allow me to um, continue to have a licensing agreement with the town of Scarborough. So we will, the, right now that, that float is operating under three jurisdictions, the Department of Marine Resources with this LPA for aquaculture. We are there, uh, the gear is also approved by the um, Army Corps of Engineers and we have the lease agreement with the, um, with, with the town of Scarborough. So we would be removing the, uh, the Department of Marine Resources purview over this since we would no longer be performing aquaculture on this, on this float. Um, but the Army Corps had just asked me to have a revised lease and then they would um, allow me to continue without reapplying, um, just continue our presence there. Does that make sense? Sorry. <laughs> yep. So the red line version uh, of the lease uh, reflects all the proposed changes. Yes. Uh, um, so I kept in there, we've, we've been paying, uh, I think it's a $420 fee annually, um, which is in theory reflecting the electric usage there. We haven't used electric for a few years, but I, I feel like we, it's, it, it seems like fair rent. So um, I didn't modify that or try to wiggle out of that. But, um, Just last point from a process yep. point of view, this matter was taken up by the Coastal Waters and Harbors Committee. Yeah. Uh, and I believe that there was a favorable recommendation, certainly no opposition yes. uh, that I'm aware of. Yes. I met with them, uh, I think, two months ago. And there's the, the only issue is that it's a little bit time sensitive because uh, the limited purpose application lease um, expires on the 31st of December. Mm -hmm. So if I could, if there were to be a favorable opinion, it would be very helpful to me to have that sooner than later so I don't have to 
blow up all agreements and reapply to the Army Corps. And in defense of Ms. Carroll, uh, her request came to me initially in mid-August, so it's not as if she waited to the last moment uh, <laughs> right. working to get this matter before right. you. Any questions for no? Do I have a motion? So moved. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. None opposed? Yeah, right. <laughs> I had three questions, but I don't have the energy anymore. So. It was a very interesting evening. Yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you. Okay, order number 19099, act on the request from the deputy tax collector for a waiver of foreclosure on the following properties, 8 David Drive, map T003, lot 008. 30 Matthews Way, MAP T003, Lot 030. 13 Crystal Lane, MAP T003, Lot 013. 19 Crystal Lane, MAP T003, Lot 019. 11 David Drive, MAP T003, Lot 011. And 18 Balsam Street, and uh, sorry, excuse me, 184 Balsam Street, and authorize the town manager to sign the necessary documentation. Yes, uh, this is uh, unfortunately ends up being an annual um, matter that, that comes to council. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, Maine law uh, actually has automatic foreclosures happen after a certain amount of time has passed after uh, non-payment of property tax. It's really a, a cruel and unusual uh, component of our law, uh, and it requires it's automatic, so it requires no action. Uh, it will happen after 18 months. Uh, that foreclosure date this year happens to be uh, December 20th, and included in those number of properties that are moving toward automatic foreclosure are a number of properties uh, on this order. All of these are older um, mobile homes, and in all respects, uh, they really, frankly, are more liability than asset, and so uh, we do recommend the council uh, waive foreclosure so we don't become automatic owners of these properties, and uh, please answer any questions. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. It seems like every year we've got a number of them coming from the Crystal, whatever it's called, up on it's true. Outer what it, County Road or wherever they are. Um, I'm just, I have a concern as to what's going on up there. I've been up there. I've been in it, not in a while, but I just have concerns about condi general conditions of that particular mm. mobile home park, and I don't know what sort of... Has code enforcement been in there to oh, make certainly. sure things are up to snuff? And certainly have. We're aware that there's new ownership and they're okay. making significant investment in utilities okay. and roadways. So uh, we're hopeful that we'll see vast improvement. Yeah, good, because I was just concerned for the people who live there. It's yeah, this is an area, if you're not familiar, it's, uh, it's, it's off Route 22. It's uh, almost maybe the last property before you get to Buxton or, or Gorham, I guess, in that, in that yeah. way. But it's really all to itself. You wouldn't even know it's part of Scarborough, yeah. frankly. Is there a motion? So moved. Yeah, I was going to say public comment, but I think we're okay. Uh, any discussion? All right, with that, all those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you. Okay, item number eight, non-action items. There are no non-action items. Oh, excuse me. No. I checked off my, my big... <laughs> My big motion here. Uh, order number 19100 is act on the request from the council chair for the appointments of council standing committee and committee liaison appointments standing committees. So I'm going to try to do this in one big motion. Uh, there is one change from what you have in your packet. The Metro Coalition was left blank. Uh, uh, that was, it was offered up to uh, Councillor Cucci and um, and that was supposed to be put on, and that was an oversight on my part, so I apologize for that. Guy's so, a workhorse. What's that? Guy's a workhorse. He, he has Tuesdays off, so he's there he is. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you, you, you need not read them all. Uh, certainly it's appropriate for you to do that. But um, Well, let's do this. I'll read the standing committees because <coughs> I think that's important to read for the public, and then the rest will be readily available online. So, uh, The new council, uh, town council standing committees, 
are as such. Appointments in the negotiation committee is going to be <coughs> Councillor Hamill as the chair, Councillor Hayes, and Councillor Katarina. The communications committee is going to be Councillor Ken Johnson as the chair, Councillor uh, Cloutier, and Count Councillor Gleistein. The fair hearing authority will be uh, Councillor Clucci chair, Councillor Ken Johnson, Councillor Katarina. Finance committee will be Councillor Hayes chair, Councillor Clucci, and Councillor Gleistein. Ordinance committee will be Councillor Katarina chair, Councillor Hamill, and Councillor Ken Johnson. Uh, Rules and policy committee will be Councillor uh, Gleistein as the chair, Councillor Clucci, and Councillor Katarina. And so with that, do I have a motion? So moved. Discussion? No, uh, no, I'll offer one comment. This was a very easy task, so I, pre I, think, I feel like we all work together in forming these, and, I, and um, I think we have a great uh, combination of continuity for some of the committees and uh, new perspectives for the others, so I'm, I'm looking forward to them. And so with that, a, um, all of those in favor? Okay, item number eight is non-action items. There are none. Item number nine, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I would suggest we skip num item number nine in the interest of time, and we do have councillor comments afterwards. So without any objections, I'm going to skip item number nine. Item number 10 is the town manager's report. Very quick, two housekeeping matters. Uh, I've been pleased to meet weekly with the chair and vice chair of the council. We continue, uh, we wish to do that going forward. Uh, we want to get some dates uh, on our calendars and, and on yours for that matter. Uh, so in the, in the vein of housekeeping, December 18th, your next council meeting, there will be a workshop at 5 p.m. This is the annual, I guess, inaugural update from the Scarborough Downs uh, project. This is a requirement. Uh, we expect that that will be, you know, well attended and interest and questions. So two hours will be allowed for that. And then later on that meeting agenda, the Public Safety uh, uh, Committee, Public Safety Building Committee would like to provide an update to the building project. Um, and then lastly, uh, with respect to the January meeting schedule, <coughs> your normal meetings are first and third Wednesdays, uh, as luck would have it. First Wednesday is New Year's Day. Yeah. And, uh, so we looked at uh, uh, simply pushing um, that meeting to the second week, and for that matter, doing the second meeting to the fourth week. So rather than first and third, it'll be second and fourth. So those dates would be January 8 and 22. And I would note that the January 22 date may be quite helpful, given the fact that the Community Center Advisory Committee, their report will be done, and it, it may be advantageous to schedule a workshop with that group that evening to be able to receive that information. And lastly, it was mentioned this uh, from the podium earlier, KRT has delivered the manual. Uh, it is voluminous, and we're kind of struggling with how to make that, share that out. Um, but uh, that is that is available in, in We'll Christmas is right around the corner. <laughs> Jesus. You're so thoughtful. Uh, <laughs> we can make arrangements. I got one gift there. there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I would just add to that that we have scheduled a, a um, goal setting workshop on a Saturday morning, which I know I'm going to make a ton of friends to do that, but. We're going to show up bright and early, and we'll have you out of here no fewer than four hours. After the new year. Uh, it's after the new year. I'll e I t I'm teaching on Saturday. Yeah, I'll email it, and we'll, okay. we'll take it from there. And I'll email it. I can't remember. Okay, item number 11, councillor comments. Councillor Clucci, take it away. I look forward to a busy year ahead. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays, everyone. Well, I've got a few things here. Uh, tree lighting. Uh, Santa is coming to town on Saturday the 7th at 5 o'clock in Memorial Park. I believe the hours are 5 to 7. There'll be Santa, there'll be hot chocolate, there's going to be food. There's going to be some take-home toys or something from Home Depot, if I'm remembering the, the flyer I got. And yeah, it ends with fireworks, as I recall. So. Anyway, everyone should come. I I know I'll be there. I think the chair's going to be I'll there. I'll be there. Too. Yeah. He, was, he and I were talking about that. Um, ordinance will be holding a meeting on December 19th. I'm not quite sure what's on the agenda yet. I need to talk to Laura over. That's it. 
Councillor Johnson? I think I've said enough tonight. Thank you. <laughs> You're becoming my favorite counselor. <laughs> counselor, <laughs> Council Hamill. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if every meeting is going to be like this, but I, I think this is right up there in terms of uh, the number and complexity of issues. So, I mean, yes. we're, this is life as we know it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't get to pick the stuff that comes our way, but I think we are taking the right approach by really trying to drive inclusion, trying to drive uh, putting smart people against the tough questions and, you know, really working hard together at f figuring out solutions to tough problems. So I'm, I'm very encouraged and hope that, the, that people share my enthusiasm and sense of buoyancy and hope that it lasts uh, you know, a couple months at least. So thank you. Okay, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All those in favor? <laughs> Yeah, we've listened to this one. Yeah. Uh, I can't get the stupid things in.